Hi, everybody. Welcome to the April 8th meeting of the Arlington School Committee. As people come in, I'm going to go ahead and do our script. Um, let's see. Good evening. This open meeting of the Arlington School Committee is being conducted remotely consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12, 2020, due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth. In order to mitigate transmission of the virus, we have been advised and directed to suspend public gatherings. And as such, the governor's order suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. The order, which you can find posted with agenda materials for this meeting, allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless such participation is required by law. This meeting will feature public comment. In this meeting, the Arlington School Committee is convening by Zoom as posted on the town's website identifying how the public may join. Please note this meeting is being recorded. Some attendees are participating by video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that others may be able to see you and take care not to screen share your computer. Anything you broadcast may be captured by the recording. All of the materials for this meeting except any executive session materials are available on the Novus Agenda dashboard. We recommend members of the public follow the agenda as posted on Novus. Um, I will introduce each speaker. Please remember to speak clearly. For any response, please wait until the chair leaves the floor to you. If members wish to engage in colloquy with other members, please do so through the chair. All, vote taken, all votes taken in this meeting will be conducted by a roll call vote. So let's do our attendance. Um, starting with the committee, Ms. Exton here. Um, and Mr. Cardin is going to be late. Um, Dr. Allison Ampey, I don't see her yet either. Um, Mr. Thielman. Here. Uh, Mr. Schlickman. Good evening. Mr. Hainer. Here. And I am here. So we have a quorum and I see Dr. Allison Ampey is here. Um, Dr. Bodhi. Here. Uh, Dr. McNeil. Here. Um, I see um, Ms. Fernandez. Here. Um, Mr. Mason. Here. Eagle. Here. Palmer. Here. Dr. Janger. Here. And I think that's everybody who we're expecting. Um, okay, great. So the first item on the agenda is public comment. Ms. Fitzgerald said that there was nobody who had signed up tonight for public comment. Um, so shortly we're going to turn to the first agenda item, which is um, Dr. Bodhi and uh, council around pool testing. But I wanted to start and take my three minutes of public comment tonight. This is my last meeting um, as chair of the Arlington School Committee. I became chair like 10 years ago, um, or at least that's what it feels like. It was 10 months, but it feels like it was 10 years um, back in June, took over from Mr. Cardin. Um, and I'm delighted to be passing along to Mr. Hainer um, as expected on at Monday night's meeting. Um, so it's been a really, really long 10 months. It's been a very hard, um, it's been a you know really challenging time for our schools, um, and uh, it's been uh, an extremely uh, it's been a, it's a it's been an extraordinary experience for me to be the chair of this committee during this time of such extraordinary extraordinary upheaval and change um, in how we're delivering education across Arlington. And um, I have learned so much um, from all of the people that we have been able to work with and see leading our schools, um, members of the committee, obviously, but also Dr. Bodhi and her team, um, all of our principals and administrators. Um, we've never seen so much of them during my time <laughs> on this committee. We've never seen um, our principals as much as we have over the last 10 months. Um, and so I um, have, it's just, it's really been such a privilege and an honor for me to be able to learn so much from them and, um, and, you know, just, you know, think about and talk about how we are around each other and how we treat each other. Um, so I, you know, I'm really, I'm really proud of the work um, that we've done as a committee over the last 10 months. I um, am so grateful to um, Ms. Fitzgerald for really keeping the ship afloat um, for all of us and keeping us in line and making making sure that we're organized and following the rules. Um, and we've had some good laughs along the way. Um, so I've been really, I've been really appreciative of that. She's been so gracious with me um, and given us so much of her time. Um, and also, you know, Rob and Rod and Michael, Dr. McNeil, um, Mr. Mason, um, Ms. Elmer, 
Mr. Spiegel, Kathy's whole team, um, you guys have all been so generous with your time with me. There have been many times where I've been confused or not sure what's happening and, and you have all been so uh, willing to explain to me and, and bring me in and let me know what's happening. And uh, I have so enjoyed working with all of you in this capacity over the last 10 months. Um, you know, again, I've, I've learned so much from you and from how you work and how you do your work. Um, and I will certainly take that with me as a, a committee member as we move forward. Um, and then finally, um, Dr. Bodhi, you know, we um, have known each other for many years. We've worked together on the committee. This has been an extraordinary time um, to work together as chair and superintendent. I, I don't think that this was certainly not what I expected when I ended up where I did in the in the line of succession for this committee. And I know that it wasn't certainly what you expected um, when you announced your retirement a couple of years ago. So um, I, I have felt a lot of um, empathy for, but also appreciation for you and for your leadership and for um, uh, you know, how we've been able to do this um, together. And uh, so I, um, I know that, you know, the next few months, you will continue as you have always been. And uh, I, I will miss our conversations. Um, but I know that, you know, we will continue in, in your very, very capable hands for the next few months. So thank you so much to the committee for your patience. Um, and graciousness as we've moved through this. I've never chaired a meeting in person um, and may never, <laughs> which is actually um, just fine with me. I feel like I came here and I did everything that I could possibly do for 10 months and I'm more than happy to step away um, and, and look forward to Mr. Hainer being the chair. So thank you so much. Um, I want to um, move on to the first agenda item, which is um, pool testing. And Dr. Bodhi has um, an update for us from uh, her conversations with um, Mr. Heim and just their thinking around pool testing in the district. So Dr. Bodhi, you can go ahead. Well, thank you. But I, I really do need to, be, before I move into the report on this, thank you. Uh, we've had, I don't know if we can figure out how many hours we've talked um, this year, but a lot. And I've enjoyed the conversations. I appreciate so much um, your leadership during this time because you've done it with the, led these, these meetings with a lot of grace, sense of humor, and th there's just been a very good feeling uh, about all of that. So thank you to, uh, thank you as well. It doesn't mean we can't continue to talk, <laughs> uh, but yes, it's been a very challenging year uh, for everyone. And I have to say, I think we've done a pretty darn good job of how we've gotten through this year. And, um, you know, thank you to, you know, and you and Mr. Thielman are running on a post, which I think says a lot too about the confidence of the community in terms of, of how the school committee has um, been a partner and a leader in, as we've gone through uh, this year. So thank you to you as well. And I'm sure there's gonna be many more kudos to you um, on Monday night, yes, probably so, and maybe even tonight. So thank you very much, it's been a pleasure. So to pool testing, um, yes, I have had a conversation with Mr. Heim on this issue. In fact, more than one in the last uh, few weeks. Um, so the issue is whether we should uh, mandate pool testing um, for students that are in person. And uh, let me proceed before our, our, my conversation about that, is that one of the things that um, the Department of Education has said to districts who are participating in the state program and who are receiving these um, shipments of Binex for follow-up and for testing is that we cannot require uh, students uh, to, to um, it can't be mandated. We can't require students to take the pool, the pool test. Um, now, does that mean that you can't mandate it? It's a more nuanced uh, answer on that one. And it's, it's, it's complicated. And I, I think that, that at this point, um, it, it would probably be wiser to continue our efforts in terms of 
you know, encouraging parents to have a consent for their child that be pull tested. And I will say that, you know, a combination of this, uh, our encouragement on the meeting, the principals, and I understand there's been some social media around this as well. The, the percentages have really improved a lot. Uh, literally, this is hot off the presses today because we wanted to include uh, this, the results from this week. <clears throat> so I, I sent you uh, for each one of the elementary schools, but if you look at K-5 altogether as a group, it's a 90% participation. Yes, would we like to have 100%? Yes, and we're gonna continue to um, encourage parents to do this, uh, to sign the consent form. In fact, uh, it's a little bit late, but the February newsletter went out because it, it takes a little bit of time to, uh, you know, as a follow-up to that month. But I also put in that newsletter, the links for both K-5, 6-8, six, uh, six, and the high school for parents to sign a, a consent form. Um, at Gibbs, the percent is 83%, which is up from the last time. And I think the, the most spectacular rise is with Oz Middle School, which has gone from 70% um, to 93%. So it, we are moving in the right direction in terms of uh, the percentages. At the high school, um, as you know, we mandated uh, pool testing for all athletes. And so in the fall two season, which is the third season of this year, presently in, we have a couple hundred students, a little more than that, um, who are being pool tested weekly. When we get to spring athletics, that number really jumps up. There's gonna be over 400 students uh, that will be pool tested weekly. So uh, there is also a plan for other students who are not athletes to um, be pool tested. Uh, and you're gonna hear, we can talk more about that um, after we hear the report in um, what the plan is for the high school to return to a full-time in-person instruction. But I, I'm really very pleased with these results. Um, we wanna, you know, next time I report on this, I'm hoping it may be right after vacation, we'll see uh, more of a jump than even this. But at any rate, um, I think at this juncture, because it's a little bit more complicated um, that we just simply um, not go forward at this point uh, with any mandate uh, with respect to pool testing. Uh, so that's basically where, uh, where the issue is and happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you, Dr. Bodhi. Uh, questions for the committee around this? Great. So seeing then, so, you know, I, I appreciate so much the efforts of the principals to encourage families to sign up. I do think that it helps to send out the, I know that some do and some don't, to send out the pool testing results each week. Um, even if they're negative, it's still good news. It's nice to get them. Um, and so I think it, you know, just helps people remember that it's, that it's happening. Um, and, uh, and, you know, it encourages people to continue signing up. So I hope that we can continue to drive those numbers up. 90% at um, across K-5 is great, but there are some schools that are, are lower um, and some that are much higher. So I think we wanna you know, just keep driving those, driving that participation up because it's such an important part of the mitigation strategies that the district has invested in to keep everybody safe at yeah. school. So. Yes, and we will continue to do that. I will say the elementary numbers also include in the base, the returning students from remote this week. Um, actually, there was a something I sent out to all staff, but maybe um, interesting for those listening, really what our, our pool testing has looked like. We have processed to date, well, actually to the end of March, uh, 2,150 pools, which means that this represents nearly 20,000 individual samples. And of those 2,150 pools, only nine uh, pools were positive. So, um, the, you know, the, it's a partnership with everyone. P parents aren't sending their children to school sick. 
We have great pro protocols in place for safety. And I think all of these things are working um, to keep everyone safe as we go forward. So thank you. And by the way, uh, Dan Sheehan, who is our, the interim director for um, technology for both town and schools is, is joining us this evening as well. Great, Dr. Allison Amby. Thank you. Um, Dr. Bodhi, when you spoke with council, did you ask about the possibility of doing it as an opt out as opposed to opt in? It's so not mandating, but saying you're in unless you opt out. Um, I think that that can be a school committee decision if you want to do that. We've done that with other kinds of permissions. And this, you know, we have that on our uh, portal for different things, but they are different. Permissions for you know getting your pictures in the newspaper, or, or, or that's different. Um, to be honest, we did not talk about that, um, but I think that that is sort of in that narrow range of would Desi think that we are mandating it by that process. But you know what, I can follow up with that and let you know when we get, um, maybe even Monday night, I can, I can let you know. If, if we have an agenda item for new business, which I think we do, or maybe okay. old. Okay. Thank you. Uh, anybody else on this item? Great. Okay. So the next one um, is is a, a really beefy one. I'm I'm um, trying to talk while we wait for Dr. Jenger to, to come back. Um, here he comes. Um, and I, I put all of your items, Dr. Jenger, in here all together. We have Italian, we have heterogeneous classes, we have semesters, and we have full return. So we uh, could basically be here uh, till tomorrow, probably, if we gave all of these items their due. But I think a couple of them are just sort of um, brief updates for the um, for the committee and the community around um, where you guys are on this. And then the full return plan um, is obviously the, the the crux of the whole thing. So I defer to you on how you want to how you want to work through this list. You're on mute, unfortunately, although we do very much want to hear what you have Let, to say. Let's go from small to big because I, I otherwise we'll get to the end of full return and I will not even remember what we were going to say about the other ones. So let me just start with Italian. So um, there's a longer explanation kind of of where we are in the direction with Italian. Um, but the, the simple version is um, the Italian program is the only language that we teach um, at the high school that does not have a pipeline going into it. And we've been building out on the Italian um, over, well, I, I think it started right as, right as I came in, so eight or nine years. Um, and what we've been seeing over the last four or five years is that the, the numbers have shrunk. And more importantly, what we find is that when you get, let's say, 20 freshmen in, there's a two-year graduation requirement. So you'll usually go 20 to about 18 the next year. Um, the third-year students don't have to take it, but it's a requirement or an expectation in many state schools and many other schools that you take three years. So the numbers drop down at that point to about 15. And by the fourth year, um, we regularly have sections of 10, 8, 12. Um, we try really hard not to run sections that are under about 18. Um, sometimes we do because as you know, see, there's a pipeline going into it. We've made a commitment to those students or because we're trying to build a program or because we're trying to build it into another pipeline. Um, but over the last four or five years, we've been looking at this pattern in Italian and seeing that it doesn't sustain the numbers. So it becomes an expensive program to run and a program where we have not made until students arrive in high school, a commitment. So if a student, you know, doesn't have the option to take Italian one when they get to the high school, they didn't take another class. If a student's taken Mandarin one in sixth grade, our expectation is we really have to provide the full program, so, you know, six through um, 12, because that student has made the commitment of time. We told them we were going to have a program and support that over that time. So as you guys saw, um, the Italian one option, and there are years when we, for example, don't offer Mandarin one at the high school because we don't have enough interest. We do offer Mandarin two because students are coming out of the middle school. Um, so in the program of studies, 
We did not include Italian one this year. Uh, there was not a lot of conversation. I was not at that meeting. Um, but subsequently, there were some folks that contacted, I know you and me and Dr. Bodhi, who, who really felt strongly about their interest in Italian. So we reviewed the program, we went over the numbers, um, and we decided to put it back in the program of studies for this year and to offer that for, for freshmen. But in order to be able to maintain that program, we're looking to have 20 freshmen enter so that as we can see, you get that 2018, 15. And we want folks to understand that if we're having numbers in the neighborhood of 10 or 12 in four years, we may not offer um, Italian four, that we can't really make that commitment right now. And we want folks to understand that. But our goal, and this is important, is not to eliminate Italian as a fifth language at the high school. We're trying to have as many rich language options as possible. One of the ways in which Italian was sort of envisioned as we went forward was as an opportunity, you know, it's the, third, it's the fourth European Romance language that we teach in the high school, if you count Latin as a Romance language. And so what we had been looking at and our long-term plan was next year and then the year after to look at offering what we call Italian intensive, an option, an option that some schools have experimented with. And the idea is a student who's taken two or three years of another language could either double up or transfer into um, Italian one, two. And the idea of that, it's a one year class that prepares you to go on to the second class in college. If you only took Italian one, for example, right now as a senior, when you went to most colleges, you'd have to retake Italian one because there wouldn't be an, a college class that would fit into the amount of content you had. So the simple, that was a long explanation, but the simple answer is um, we put Italian um, one back in the program of studies. Unfortunately, I think um, Ms. Morgan pointed out to us that I guess the letter did not go out from the middle school. It's now gone out. We will leave the program of studies open. If somebody calls us the day after it closes and says, I didn't realize that was out there, we'll, we'll open it back up for them. But if folks are interested in taking Italian, they should go into their requests and make sure that they request Italian one so we can get an accurate view of the numbers and interest. So that's Italian. Do we want questions about Italian before I go on to heterogeneous grouping? Sure because otherwise we'll forget what our questions are about Italian. Does anybody have any questions about Italian? Dr. Alice Nippy. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if it's not possible to do a combination of Italian three and four, which would bring up your, um, I mean, they, they have to readjust the course, but it bring up your numbers. It would offer the ability to continue the languages for the people who wanted to, and it would keep keep the, classes going? So I will say that that is something we have done in past years um, in order to keep the program functioning. Um, you know, the numbers still get problematic if you've got two sections of 12. It's not a long-term great plan, right? And I know our Italian staff have really not wanted to do it um, in terms of the way they feel like it works. One of the other challenges of the Italian program um, is, you know, it never gets to AP because we don't have students coming in at that level. We have a much lower participation in honors level. Very few students take it for the honors level on level one and two. So there's a lot of ways in which it, it's hard for us to create a program that doesn't have the full commitment to the district all the way up through the middle school. Um, but it's a conversation. We've now got a year to, to continue to have a conversation about. And um, you know we should probably come back to that early as something that's not waiting for the program of studies since clearly there's an interest there. Um, and my one question, Dr. Jinger, on this was that the email that we got from um, Mr. McCarthy didn't say that that Italian, I, I, I'm not, my kid's not going to take Italian, but um, that the direction was to email Ms., to email Don Carney, or Don, uh, I'm looking for her name here, yeah, Don Carney, um, to put their names on the list if the course is offered, but that it's, it doesn't imply that it is possible to select it in power school right now. Is that well, what you're planning to? It is. My understanding. <laughs> Sorry. My understanding is that both of those things are true, that it is possible to select it. But I think some folks have put in their submissions and may not be able to go back in again. Okay. So, but the directions that are in the email from Mr. McCarthy to, okay. to email Don, uh, to email Don Carney is the way to go for people who are interested in taking Italian. Follow Mr. McCarthy's directions always. That's what I do, but just, you know, double check. All right, great. Anybody else for Italian? Great, all right, what next, Dr. Janger? 
So I, I don't have a long conversation about heterogeneous. We made a commitment to send out a whole bunch of surveys. We got those surveys just about written, and then we started working on the return, which came right after that. So the surveys have gone out to sort of get information about next year. But in the conversations that we've been having and planning those surveys with the staff, uh, talking within the district level, we made a determination that although we haven't had that longer conversation that I promised, um, we're really not prepared at this point to do the heavy lift to do heterogeneous grouping next fall or to be perfectly honest, semesterized classes. So in the surveys that have gone out to eighth grade parents, eighth grade students, and then high school students and high school parents, um, the notes explain that what we're really trying to get is people's input and feedback so we can look at the experiences we've had. We've gotten pretty good responses um, at the high school, particularly from parents, um, but we really do encourage folks to, um, to get in there. We would like as much feedback as possible so we can feel like the feedback we have is representative. And what we are seeing um, in the high school experience, which is a lot of what we were really interested in, right? Our students have now had experience with heterogeneous grouping, with semesterized classes, um, with different uses of remote instruction. Um, there were a couple of other pieces with longer block classes. Um, and so it was really helpful to see how different folks um, engage in it. And, um, you know, there's a, there's a, I guess what my simple version, and we'll come back and I'll present on the, those responses next time, uh, you, whenever you'd like me to. Um, but after the staff have had a chance to go through those and talk about what we're doing with them. Um, but we are seeing a sort of a modestly positive um, majority, sort of the, the hump is more in terms of people having had positive experiences at the high school with, um, particularly with heterogeneous classes. And at the same time, what you see is a lot of concern about it at the eighth grade. Um, you know, so it's like one graph looks like this and one graph looks like that. So clearly in terms of understanding why we're doing it, how we're doing it, communicating that out, making sure the teachers are prepared and able to speak to it, that's some work we really have to do. Great questions for the committee around heterogeneous classes, just the info that was presented this evening. Okay, uh, semester schedule. Semester schedule. Oh. whether we're going to do semesters or oh, that was this i think i just said that that was a oh, note sorry. Of... okay yeah yeah i mean the, the simple answer right now is that we will look at the information that we get back from those surveys and have a conversation with the teacher teachers but at this point the larger lifts are on things like semesterized schedules and heterogeneous classes as the requirement for all ninth graders are not things we're planning on pursuing great all right full return Here all we right. Go. <laughs> for all the marbles so I, I always struggle with, you know, you wrote it all out and now do I have to talk through it all? But what I'm going to do is kind of talk through a little bit of the sort of the preamble to that memo, which is the table. Um, I apologize to folks, especially folks at home who are trying to read the table, which is trying to do two things at the same time. One, summarize the plan um, that we are proposing, but also putting in there the sort of comparison option so people understood why we were proposing that plan. I hope folks, folks so far seem to have understood that part. I've gotten some good questions in the last 24 hours, some of which I've updated actually in the memo um, and which we'll continue to update as we build things out going forward. But um, just by way of sort of context, I mean, one, um, you know, this is the fourth time I think this year at least where I'm presenting a proposal about a completely new way of pivoting instruction um, in the next month. Um, on relatively short turnaround. And that's been a real challenge, obviously, particularly for our teachers who've had to figure out a new format. And I think one of the things we were discussing with the teacher group, I said, look, I, I was a teacher. Moving across the hall is a major disruption in the middle of the semester because everything is where I wanted to do and I maximize every second of my day. So to move the schedule, the time, 10 minutes here, five minutes there is, is a big thing to ask. And I will say one that I'm very proud of the work the staff have done um, in terms of responding to that challenge and rising to that challenge and keeping our students engaged. I'm extraordinarily proud of our students um, who have kept on coming and plugging away and being engaged, worried and stressed very much, but really engaging in that um, it's, it really is a testament to what a strong school we have. 
And it's been a privilege, I'll be honest, to lead and carry this um, community in this school through the time. And I am excited about the prospect of having kids back in the school. It's, it's you know, the emotions are, are difficult because it's also an awful lot to do. And for many folks, folks are saying, you know, to do this with six or seven weeks left, there'll be about seven weeks left in the year when we come back, is it worth it? And so I guess what I wanna say is this, I mean, we have remained, and this is to the community and to you, in terms of my perspective, and I think the perspective we wanna bring about to this. We've remained predominantly remote this year, primarily because of space issues. And those have been primarily created by the six foot distance and a building that was already overcrowded. We were about 90 plus percent capacity um, going into this fall before any of this happened because of the small building and, um, well, not really the construction project, but the space. Um, so now we have a change and we have had throughout the year, I think a tacit agreement with the community that when we could return larger numbers of kids or an in-person, when we could do so safely and logistically, that we would make every effort to do so. And to me, that's why we're here today because we've had that commitment. Um, and so we now have this CDC and state guidelines and the research that shows that this three foot chair to chair um, distance really is something that appears to be safe to do and that we can do safely. We have low levels of community transmission, which are one of the requirements for that according to the CDC at the high school level. Um, we've repaired the ventilation um, and you know, people keep asking about the ventilation because that was a big conversation in the fall. Ventilation is now working. Where it's not working, we're not using those spaces. Um, we have overwhelmingly vaccinated staff and we have testing as an option in place that really helps us to keep things safer. Those things make me comfortable saying to the staff, and to the students, come on back, we can make this work. It's not gonna be easy. We'll still be fitting like a Tetris model exactly into the building. Um, you know, I remember when we did the Tetris model the last time and we said we got 90% of the way there, three feet chair to chair gets us 99% there. Like it gets us to where we can do it, but it is going to be a really tight squeeze. And I, we know we can do it, but it's gonna be a squeeze. Um, so the determination, and this is a question, right? For many folks, we have been doing well academically. We've, you know, the failure rates have not gone significantly up. The, um, the grades have continued to be relatively strong, actually somewhat higher. Attendance continues to be consistent with past practice. Student stress is much higher than usual. Um, but the determination to return to per in-person comes from the belief that that in-person instruction for the majority of students is worth a disruption to the academic and the existing programs. And I think that's an important thing, that that really high level of student stress and concern is something that lots of people are telling us is worth this disruption, but there will be some disruption. And so in the next seven to eight weeks, what we're focusing on primarily and putting our bet behind is building relationships with kids and being safe and getting them back into school for the interpersonal piece of instruction. And our teachers, and I wanna say this, are aware of the challenges of including both groups. And I'll talk about why we're including both groups. And we're gonna work hard to keep those connections and engagement. It's going to be a change since the current model, and this is the thing, the current model really maximizes the remote experience, right? Like everyone has gotten themselves set up to do this really well. And when you split that up, it adds a new dimension. But people really are going to work very hard, and I have great faith that we will be able to make it work. Many other Middlesex um, League high schools have been doing this and are doing this in comparable ways, many of them with, uh, with comparable technology. And so they are able to do it. They won't tell you it's easy, but they're able to do it effectively. Um, so the plan, the current plan, the plan that we are proposing, keeps students with their current teachers grades and expectations. And we think that's valuable, not just to the students who choose to come in in person, but to the students who choose to remain remote. Because if we were to split, when that's the whole point of that sort of first column, if we were to have to, to split to create a remote academy, we would have to pull 20% or it's looking more like 15% at the moment, but in all of our other documents, it's been about 20%. We would have to pull those students out of other classes. 
And that would require pretty much, not pretty much, it would require every single class to be reconfigured. Some would have to be collapsed to create other sections. And an enormous number of classes would essentially not be able to run because they couldn't run for both programs. So, and I'll just give an example. The most commonly offered class is freshman English. There's about 17 sections, eight or nine one semester, eight or nine the other semester. So this semester, there's about two classes every period. So in order to accommodate 20% of the students, you'd have to shut down two of those sections, redistribute those kids across the other six sections and take the kids out of those other sections and move them in. So everybody's getting new kids and kids are moving to new periods, which, you know, and imagine that's happening in every single class. And then when you look at art classes, you know, we have one section of painting, we don't have two or three of those. So students are gonna end up in art and, you know, there'll be in-person art and out art because we couldn't offer all the different programs, all the APs, all the standalones, computer science, you name it, almost all of those would have to go one way or the other or be simplified. So it would be a significant change, a break in relationships, a break in routines. We don't think that's good for anybody in terms of their social emotional health, whether they're at home or in person. So that's why we made that decision. Um, and so there are a lot of logistical challenges to work through. I've tried to hit the highlights as I go through the memo. Each one of those highlights has you know, a memo being written behind it um, and a lot of logistics to go through. And we've been working in the past month, as soon as we heard that this was the direction we were going, to be primed with the list of questions and the list of decisions. Um, but we can't really move forward with the final decisions until we A, had an agreement with the teachers um, to change the way that they were teaching, and B, until we had really a deadline to work towards and could start asking parents to make the commitment. So it was sort of a chicken and egg. And now we're moving very quickly forward. Um, so I'll, I'll ask a question, I'll pause for a second, because I could now bore you to tears going through um, the memo and sort of hitting the points, but um, there's a lot of them, and I'm not sure that you necessarily need all of them. So would you like me to sort of hit the two or three, I think the ones people have been most interested in has been, have been um, well, we've had a little question about lunch. Um, we've had some questions about, um, well, yeah, I, to some extent, I feel like I, if I went through all of them, I'd kill you. So can, people, can you give me a sense of how you'd like me to proceed to go into the weeds, as it were? I think, you know, address lunch, because I suspect people will have questions about that, certainly. Okay. Um, and then, you know, I think probably the easiest is to give when to give the committee a chance to ask the questions and let that drive because I don't I don't want to speak for them necessarily because what I'm interested in may not be what they are so I think at lunch there's no way lunch isn't going to come up so <laughs> let's do lunch um, and then see what other people want to hear about does that work for you so I'm gonna I will go through this and I'll hit lunch but I'll go through what I think sort of a quick overview then so one the plan that we have for phasing in is to, to take that the PD day, which we've been holding in reserve and put that on Wednesday, May 5th. So that is 10 days after we return from break. Um, that would give the teachers an opportunity to really make sure everything is set up. And then our plan is to bring first, just the seniors in. So the seniors would come in in person, other students would attend remotely. That one is something that people have been asking for all year, an opportunity for just the seniors to come in and see each other. It also gives us an opportunity to look at how the movement patterns work when you put them in place, to um, explain them and review them with the seniors who I think are really gonna be leaders of this in the school. Um, and then the next day, which is Friday, we're planning to bring the freshmen and transfer students in, students who have really never been in the building. Trying to find your way around the building on a good day is challenging, but in a one-way pattern, um, when you're not supposed to backtrack and you're masked, is something we want them to be able to do in a building that's not super full. Plus we'll have just trained the seniors so our bridge builders and senior volunteers can be there to help them out. Um, we're looking for folks to make the decision as we've talked about by Tuesday. I know it's a fast turnaround. If people don't contact us, we will go with their default which is their current status under the departmental shifts um, because we need to fit classes in based on their size. Um, folks who are currently in the school and in-person programs 
those folks are will stay in their programs as they are. They should tell us that they're opting in um, when they fill out the form. Um, so PE classes, remember Wednesdays has been a special PE time. So the plan is to shut down ninth grade PE at the end of this quarter, which will be Wednesday. The ninth graders have finished their wellness curriculum. They accelerated in preparation for that. So the ninth graders would finish their ninth grade PE requirement and get that credit met. Um, and then juniors and sophomores who are signed up for PE classes are being shifted into the regular program. So it's a four day a week schedule. It's basically the same schedule we've had before. Um, I'll pull that up actually for a second because folks have asked about it. Um, let me just pull that up. Can I, do you mind if I share my screen here for a sec? Go for it. All right, so people have asked for it and I understand it's buried in there. So this is the, bell, the planned bell schedule. It looks an awful lot like what we're doing now. It's got 85 minute periods with a five minute break. We'll be using some buffer time in that period to, to shift people through the hallways. Um, so it'll really probably be more like 80 minutes of instruction and five minutes of getting everybody sorted out to get um, from class to class. The plan, and we'll look at that at this point, is to have four lunches. But with PE, um, in the normal schedule, PE classes meet twice a week. And so the plan is to get rid of the, the P1 in the middle of the day, which created that big break. We don't need that because nobody's going home anymore. Um, and so to have the four periods and PE classes will go into students' open blocks if they have them. So those students right now are being scheduled into open block classes, and then they will be contacted um, if they don't fit into those and we'll have conversations. And once they, there's room available, we'll open up PE classes to everybody. There will be in-person PE classes and remote PE classes. Those won't be blended. So going back to here, I'm gonna skip over the performing arts because it's not really a big change. We've talked about ventilation. There's a lot of information about how we'll do hygiene around COVID, pool testing. Um, but let me go back to lunch. That looks like the big one to hit. So lunch. So the plan is for us to run four lunch periods. If there's a thousand kids in the school, that's 250 kids eating lunch at a time. Um, and that's still a lot of kids to space six feet apart, sitting down at a table. That's considered a mask break because they're taking their mask off. So they're not supposed to be walking around. Any student is available, is, has eligibility, remember, to free lunch. So students will be able to pick up lunch in the cafeteria. Our plan is to use the cafeteria space, the blue gym space, all of the courtyard. Um, and the, in the courtyard right now, we have a large tent. Um, I think it's 30 by 60. It's a pretty large tent. In addition to that, we have under what are called the links, um, a few thousand square feet of covered space. And we've actually got patio heaters that are in there if we start to still have cold weather after that. So there is some outdoor covered space as well. And we are letting students, and this has been something we've been doing all year long, when students are not assigned and lunch would count, they can leave, they can go outside. So they could go out to the field or the parking lot um, or you know they could go for a walk during that time. Um, and so that's something we've been doing all year long. They can be, otherwise they can be in study hall spaces, which we'll have um, in the pit or old hall um, or in the gyms during other periods. And um, sorry, people are walking behind me. Um, and um, I lost my train of thought with, with walking gap. But so that's, that is the plan there. And the way we do four lunches is students, and this we've done this in the past, usually it's been three. Some students have lunch right before their C block class. Some go to C block class for half an hour, then have a 25 minute break. Some go for 50 minutes and then have a 25 minute break. And then some go after their class. So there's four lunch blocks with a little break in between them to let the students transition. Um, so I think the other big piece, which I've gotten lots of questions on, is how does this look for a blended class? And, you know, I think what I'll start with is the simple, right? Because kind of what you can expect. And then teachers have all kinds of creative ideas they've talked about beyond that. But the basic setup that we're envisioning is that every teacher already has a MacBook. 
every teacher already has a MacBook and every teacher for a second camera um, as the basic setup will be issued a Chromebook. Um, and so, and I've actually done some staff meetings run this way. So the teacher can be teaching like this with their main device in front of them. And their Chromebook as a secondary device can potentially be pointed at the class or potentially pointed at the whiteboard as a place to be. Um, and they actually, I mean, there were other more expensive, fancier cameras, but actually that setup really works pretty well. In addition, we've purchased these sound lips. We've been using them um, for the last semester, which are just hip worn with a little personal mic that talks like this, that raises your teacher voice. So when you're masked and trying to be picked up by a microphone and trying to be heard by a class, you can be heard pretty clearly. And those work very simply. You just put them on and um, turn them on. We've asked teachers, they can sign them out or we can issue them to a teacher if they want to have them. So that basic setup, remember you've got an 80 minute long class, allows a teacher to be teaching in person. Students who are you know, watching at home are either projected up on the whiteboard or the PowerPoint you're using is on the whiteboard or they're watching what you're writing up on the whiteboard over there. And there's a lot of configurations of that, but that's the basic setup. Now, in terms of envisioning that, there are things that are great about that and there are things that are challenging about that. Um, one of the challenges is it's not a great setup to have lots of large in-person uh, conversations. If there's a lot of crosstalk in a whole class, the students at home, they may be able to hear, we have fancy microphones that we'll bring into folks that are doing that, but it's harder for those folks to see and participate. Most of the time when you've seen teachers doing this kind of instruction, they stick with more of an interactive lecture or what's called IRE where they ask questions and students respond to them. So they can then repeat or make sure the students at home heard or the students in person heard the students at home. And then when you wanna have crosstalk among students, you transition to group work that then can happen amongst remote students on Zoom classes, on the Zoom or in class amongst students. Now, another question that's come up and Dan probably can speak to this much better than I can, but I can speak about it instructionally, is what is our capacity within the building? Um, and so the idea there is you're not gonna have 20 kids all on a Zoom call. Um, there's no reason to bring 20, you know, 20 kids into, 15 kids into the class and then have them all staring at the screen. Um, what you're most likely to have is a couple of Zoom calls running here. You may run a couple of Zoom calls with students who are in person or talking to kids who are remote. But for the most part, you're gonna be running two to four Zoom calls in every classroom. And my understanding is that we have capacity for that. The big issue we have to work on is making sure that everything is maintained and stable. So that's kind of the main piece there. And we're looking to get videos and examples from other folks who've done it in other schools. And I know our staff are already department by department reaching out because they're, they're very rapidly asking questions that are much more complicated, right? How do I run a lab? If we're doing a fetal pig dissection, which is a plan for biology, how do I make sure that I maximize the involvement of the kids at home? And so I know people are working in that direction. I think that is it. So questions. Great, um, Dr. Janger, can you stop sharing your screen just for right now so I can see? Yep makes it easier for me to see who's here. Um, so I see Mr. Hainer, go ahead, Mr. Hainer. Thank you very much. Uh, first off, just a comment on the lunch. Uh, the idea of letting students uh, be free to go out of the building makes me extremely nervous. I come up there once a week to sign the payroll warrant. The traffic behind the building is constant uh, going on. Uh, it, the 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 geography there is just not what it was a year ago. So I, I, I'll ask you to reconsider that and uh, put some limits on it. There's trucks, there's vehicles going back and forth. There's a lot of uh, stuff going on. That's just behind the building. Uh, uh, quick question. Uh, I guess I'd like to hear from uh, uh, Mr. Sheehan. Do we have the capacity to do all this as far in the technology aspect uh, to provide a consistent program Thank you, Mr. Hainer. Um, what we've looked at, uh, we do. Um, we've, we've checked everything from our internet connection to our firewalls to our uh, in-school network, and everything says we have capacity to do this. 
Uh, we've worked with Dr. Janger and come up with a model we think is acceptable and will work, yes. Great, thank you. And uh, I don't wanna speak for the rest of the committee, but I know the qu question has been asked by several people. Do you need more from us to make things work? And I'd like Dr. Janga to, to be aware of that. Uh, I'll stand corrected by any other members of the committee on that. Another question, um, you mentioned, has there been a contractual change between the teachers and uh, the school department with regard, because my memory was, that we had agreed with the teachers not to do simulcast and remote at the same time. What you've suggested here is that. I'm not opposed to it, don't misunderstand. I just wanna understand if we've changed the contract. So, and Kathy, uh, Dr. Bodie can speak to this more than I can. In the memorandum of agreement, it says that teachers can volunteer to do so. They aren't enjoined from doing it, but we can't expect them to do so. Um, and so the, 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 the letter of agreement, it's not a contractual modification, is the teachers agreeing to, to, to do this as a whole. So if a teacher, you've already I contacted- want to speak to all that? The, all the teachers have agreed to, to go forward, volunteer, am I correct? Uh, well, it, yes, This the question was put to the teachers um, earlier this week and 80% of the teachers agreed that this, you know, given the two options, they agree to this option. And so, yes, we are vol the volunteering piece of it is going forward with the, uh, with the teachers. As Dr. Jenger said, the MOA that was agreed to back in September with the school committee did not uh, uh, enjoin teachers from doing it. It just made, it was not required. And so people, they just were choosing and that's, we wanted them to make sure that they were on board with this choice because we have to choose one or the other. There's, you know, there there's can't be anything in between of the two options. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not clear on that. I thought we weren't having two options. We were having uh, one, the classroom was going to be a, a blending of the two. Am I well, correct? Well, as Dr. Jango was saying, um, the other option would be to change all the classes. I, okay, but... You just said that 80% have agreed to do it voluntarily. That yes. simple so math says 20% of it have not agreed to do it. So. Well, that's correct. But the high school has to go one way or the other. We're either gonna go with um, the, the, the blended or we're gonna have to change everybody's schedule. And so okay. it was really deciding which way the high school was gonna go and, you know, laying so, that up for teachers to decide. I don't want to believe you this, but what I'm hearing is that it was the choice was made, therefore 20% are not going to have the choice that was in the memorandum of agreement. Am I correct? Um, that's essentially correct, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Morgan. All right, anybody else? Uh, Mr. Cardin and then Mr. Thielman. Uh, thank you and thank you Dr. Jenger for all your hard work in doing this. I'm thrilled that we uh, are at this point where uh, I didn't think we would be where we might actually get people back in the building. Um, just a couple of things um, because because of the, the the challenging logistics I would actually you know, as, as you're still planning, encourage you to think about additional senior days and that, that week leading up to the change. Um, I think just one day with the seniors and one day with the freshmen, you know, may not be sufficient to test to make sure everything's working well. And of course, the more time the seniors have um, by themselves in the building, um, you know, the better experience they'll have because they're leaving early in June. So uh, just ask to consider that as you're continuing to plan um, I actually disagree with Mr. Hainer. I mean, I, I think um, the, it's an extreme year. Um, we're gonna have to trust our students to be responsible coming in and out of the building. And um, so I, I'm glad to see that you're giving them that flexibility. Um, uh, and then it, I, I guess, uh, I, I don't wanna put you on the spot, Ms. Fernandez, because um, I, I don't know how involved you were with this, this agreement, but I guess, you know, the concern that we've heard from a, from possibly indirectly from a teacher is that they're 
they're not thrilled with this, you know, agreement. Um, and I guess what is what is sort of the, you know, it, obviously we have to make a choice. We have to go one way or the other. Um, are are you know are are the teachers collectively okay, or are we going to find out that there's going to be a couple of recalcitrant teachers who, you know, contractually they're not obligated to do this. Um, so that would that would put us in a difficult situation. Ms. Pretty, so, do you want to take this one or? <laughs> yeah, I can. I can give it a go. Yeah, do your best. <laughs> Right. So, I mean, this is a year of not ideal situations and having to accept not really being okay. So to say that we're okay, I don't, I don't know that we'd go that far. Um, but kind of the official position here is that 80% agreed to accept the change of language. And so because that's a majority, the union has agreed to sign it. So um, I wouldn't say okay, but I, I don't think there's a a large concern on our end in terms of the, the agreement we reached. Okay, great. And I, I do appreciate the flexibility of the teachers. Um, you know, this has uh, been a very challenging year. They have to pivot once again. This, this dual teaching is extremely challenging. And, you know, fortunately for, at least for Arlington, we've only, we're only gonna do it for a couple months as compared to the whole year it's been in some other districts. So I do appreciate all your efforts. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Thielman. Thank you, Ms. Morgan. And uh, I want to echo uh, the words of other people on the, on the committee and how grateful we are for, for finally getting to a point where we can open up uh, the school. Um, I, I just want to make a few points uh, in response to concerns that about the, uh, the students in the building project. When, the, when, the building, uh, <clears throat> when our building team, our design team, and our construction team, and the building committee were planning for the year, um, uh, we were planning for students to come back to school. So safety protocols are in place to make sure that the students would be safe uh, coming in and out of the building and going out uh, to the, to the uh, field for activities. And uh, so I, I have a great deal of faith in Dr. Janger, his staff, Mr. McCarthy, everybody on the team to make sure kids are safe when they go out for lunches or any other activity. And the construction team is very mindful of the fact that students are in the building. And in fact, students have been in the building over the past uh, year, uh, a small number of students, but students have been in the building uh, and, and the construction team has protocols in place that it is following carefully to be sure everyone is safe. So uh, <clears throat> there's no evidence to the contrary. The second thing I wanna say is an 80% vote by anybody is a good sign of uh, confidence. Uh, and uh, so I think we need to recognize that 80% voted in favor of this change. And that's a pretty uh, substantial uh, vote. Um, uh, so my question is <clears throat> um, how we're going to treat um, any potential positive case. Uh, is, is, is our protocol, I mean, what, what is the protocol going to look like? What is the decision going to look like? If there's a positive case of a student in the high school, in a class, are you, is this going to lead to Obviously, obviously that, just, that student has to be quarantined. I get that, but for the fact that students are studying uh, apart from each other, wearing masks, following safety protocols in uh, rooms that are ventilated, what is our, what's our protocol gonna be when, when, when that happens? So our current plan is, and you know, these things change, right? We, were, we got, this is four weeks from now and we will fine tune this in regard to whatever the current um, guidance is. But our current expectation has been with an abundance of caution to, to go beyond the within six feet for 15 minutes rule. And so it's pretty much been our practice. And at the moment, it's our expectation that if one student is in the school, the three classes that that student was in would be quarantined. All those teachers who are vaccinated, I believe don't need to be quarantined. The nice thing about this model is um, we're set up for remote instruction. So those students could then participate remotely during that time. And they would have to because they would actually be in other classes because the kids cross cohorts and not staying with the same group of kids. Um, if over time, you know, the district changes its larger view on that to say within six feet, then we would start doing mapping of who's within the circle of that student. But at the moment, the plan is that if a student is in place, the three classes that student passes through would be 
quarantined for the quarantine period. And that's one of the reasons why um, we are not planning on having homeroom um, because we don't want to create another 25 you know, kid group um, as, as people move through the day. I would just encourage uh, you to study this. There are, there are districts that have had, you know, at, at least a 50-50 hybrid model in the high school. And I, I just look around to see if that's the protocol that everyone has followed. I'm, I'm not, I understand it's a, it's a very safe protocol and, um, and it's ultimately the decision of court. That's actually an administrative decision. The school committee really doesn't have a role here, I don't think. Uh, but <clears throat> I would just encourage you to, to maybe study what other districts are doing to see if that's the best. Yeah, uh, and as we've talked to other districts, you know, it splits. They it go does. Both ways. They go both ways. And one of the, you know, and some of why they split has to do with how disruptive it is, depending, yes. on, depending on the different model. There are districts that don't do, that do not quarantine a whole cohort. They, right. they, they do contact tracing and they make a decision based on their best judgment. And they've had good results. So I would just, I would just caution, I would just ask you to look at other districts, give some thought to this, um, because it could be very disruptive to, uh, you know, quarantine three classes, a kid, 20, 75 kids. I wrote it down. Okay. So there's this time is, to this, think about it. There's, there's, this there's is my month. growing punch list right here. Yeah, I, I mean, if there's a month to think about it. So I would just urge you over the yeah, course no, of the I, and it, it, it's good to hear that that's a perspective coming from our school committee. Yep. Thank you. All right. Uh, I don't know if there was somebody after Mr. Thuman. I see uh, Mr. Schickman and then Dr. Allison Ampey. Mr. Schickman, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jenger. It looks like this is a lot of work. And uh, uh, thank you for every uh, pirouette that the staff has had to do over the course of this year. Uh, a couple of questions. First of all, I want to say that I do favor the open campus. Anything that gets kids out of the building when they don't need to be in the building is a good thing. And uh, and, and I encourage the use of outdoor space and, and uh, an open campus approach uh, until we get through this, uh, this pandemic or until we get our outdoor uh, space open in the new building. Um, my question is, can I get a sense of the vaccine? Do we know the vaccination rate for teachers both at the high school and the rest of the district? Well, we're at the high school, I can say with some confidence that any teacher who wanted a vaccination has, has had an appointment scheduled at the very least. And I know because we spent a weekend crunching that out and making sure everyone was signed up. Mm -hmm. uh, if somebody else have an answer for the rest of the district? Uh, where we stand on teacher vaccination. Mr. Speaker. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. I don't have an exact number, but I I think that's been similar in every school. And Jenna uh, can probably speak to the audits. And I know they were helping each other, the teachers in every school and the PTOs um, have helped teachers and staff who wanted to get a vaccination appointment, get a vaccination appointment. And I think by now, most people um, if not everyone who wanted to get a vaccination appointment has already had at least one and m many have had both. So if they had the two shots. Are we tracking this? We're not. I mean, I think one of the things we wanted to be, we've encouraged it. We've, and obviously the cooperation among our, our teachers and staff has been amazing and most have really wanted it. But I mean, we haven't, um, we haven't gone that route to, to track it. And I don't think most districts are, but um, you know, it, it's just not something we um, have done to date. I mean, you, I can't, know you, can't a ask it, you cannot, I don't think you can. It's a medical piece of information. They're not obligated to reveal yeah. it. So I did survey my staff to say, you know, who's vaccinated, um, who's got an appointment and who needs an appointment. And I got, a very, you know, a chunk of folks who needed an appointment and we spent the weekend um, getting people vaccinated. I know there were actually some extra vaccines um, that following week so that people were able to do it as part of the school vaccinations. And then we've run through a few times and said, is there anybody left out there? So I would say with some confidence, I don't know how many people, there may be people in the building who have opted to not get vaccinated, although I don't think very many, but anyone who wants it has, I believe, probably already got a first shot. Yeah, that's just my, my, I want to get a sense of where we're at, uh, you know. And, and we're uh, actually pivoting at this point. I mean, my new mode thing 
is two thirds of the high school students will be eligible to get shots in a very short time. And so we're gonna start ramping up trying to make that be our next goal, which is to get the high school students vaccinated. I've heard lots of stories about teachers covering for other teachers who were traveling during the day to get a shot and uh, PTOs and other people helping schedule appointments and, and a lot of cooperation and a lot of support for the teachers. And I think that that's been really magnificent and I'm very appreciative of the folks who've been helping each other through through this part of the uh, of the reopening. And I'm, I'm very grateful. Um, and if there's anything we need to do to help out, both in terms of getting kids vaccinated Teachers uh, through the vaccination, make making this work and keeping everybody healthy. You know, we, we definitely want to do it. If anyone knows a way to get um, our local board of health first shots again, so we can start running the clinics at the high school, we will. Right. We'd be very yeah. excited to do that. Yeah, I'd love to get that done. It, it, it's just unfortunate uh, that they they pulled it back. Maybe we get a letter out to um, uh, appropriate folks uh, requesting that. We work with the Board of Health to vaccinate our high school students as soon as they become eligible. Thank you. If I could just say, I, uh, if I could interject, the Board, our, our Health Department is looking into that possibility. I don't know if that will ever will come to fruition because of they, you know, they were limited in what the kind of vaccinations they could offer uh, within the town. Well, yeah, I mean, the thing is, if there's any way we can support that, I want to know it, because if, if we can put pressure on the governor, uh, uh, talk to our legislators, do whatever we can to make it happen, I, I think it'd be good. And given that the, the increase in vaccine supply is, is, is in the pipeline, and the president has said that he expects uh, everybody who wants a shot to be able to have had one by June means that there's got to be a lot more supply in the pipeline. And if we can take advantage of that additional supply to organize a clinic for our high school students, wow, that, that would be magnificent. I'd, I'd love to see that. Dr. Alice Nappy. Thank you. Um, my question is more for our staff, I mean, more for Dr. Bodie and I guess Ms. Sherid Sheridan Curran isn't here, but it would have been for her. So I understand that under the current CDC guidelines, if you just look at Arlington, we fall under the what's called substantial transmission um, category and that three feet is felt to be adequate spacing for middle, for elementary and middle and high school. But if our numbers go up, we aren't that far away from the high uh, transmission category. Right now we're at 57 per 100,000 um, for a week and the high transmission is over 100 per 100,000 for a week. Um, I'm wondering first, who is monitoring these numbers? And second, what I note is if we go into high transmission, the recommendations are either using cohorting, which we aren't doing and can't do, or if we can't, we're back to at least six feet distance between students and classrooms. And so I just want to know, I understand right now that we're following the CDC guidelines, but I want to be sure that we're watching this going forward. And when, you know, what are we going to do if that number hits that threshold? And, um, you know, how, how is that going to roll out? Um, um, and, well, oh, we are monitoring it. Um, uh, Cindy uh, Sheridan Curran is our liaison to the health department and as well as, as one of our high school nurses as well. And we also have someone who is, is also doing a lot of our stats for it, who's a, who's a nurse in the district. So the, that is being followed. I think you're asking an excellent question is, what do we do if we get to that level? Um, 
I think that it's a, it may be more nuanced. Do, do we have it only be in the high school or is it the entire district? Do we have to go remote? Uh, you know, these are questions that we can all, we, we know how to do that. And if we have to, we will. Right now we do have a cohort model, or a, a cohort model for quarantine. So what I, mean, what I mean by that is if a student at elementary um, ha is test positive, that entire class goes up because we cannot say that there hasn't been, um, you know, that all the kids haven't been affected. That may decrease as we get to the upper grades. And I think that's something that um, the health departments uh, are looking at as to whether that can be modified as we get, as the, as the students get older. Because it's not like, you know, they may be, you know, wandering around the room. Once a high school student's probably in their desk, they're probably not wandering around the room. Um, so I can't tell you right now how that's going to be potentially changed or as we go forward, but I do want to reassure you that that is being monitored. Um, and in fact, there's a group of people that meet at least three times a week, and I'm one of them, who are discussing that is the focus of conversation is the cases and what's going on with respect to COVID in the town. Um, I think as if that starts going up, we will be certainly developing a, a plan for how we're going to respond. Fortunately or unfortunately, we have pl plenty of experience in pivoting this year. Yeah, I'm, I'm hoping that it doesn't, uh, but I'd note that the numbers for Middlesex put us firmly in the substantial transmission category and have for, I mean, basically the last six, at least the last four months, and I think probably more than that. Yeah, yeah definitely more than that. So. It's not, I'm not asking this out of idle curiosity. It's, I'm still a little uncomfortable with the idea that we're essentially bubbling Arlington and saying, well, we're okay. Never mind that everybody else right around us is having more problems, but we're okay. So we're going to do this. But I think that we need to be watching and, and uh, figure out what we're going to do if, if it doesn't, you know, if, if things, um, if there's more transmission than we're expecting. So thank you. Uh, I'll just have one more comment. The uh, transmission, uh, the positive cases in Arlington still remains just slightly over 1%. And I think it's partly what, what towns and cities are making up the middle sex, um, which has a difference. And you're right. It, it, there's a range within the, the middle sex county and we're just watching it, but we're also monitoring what's going on in our community as well. Yeah, it's, yeah. I'd say it's not, when I say cases, I'm talking about the, the number of cases yeah. that were identified and then doing the math to figure out what it is per 100,000. Right. And you know, even if it's 1%, we're still in the substantial range, so. Yeah, we, we will. All right, anybody else? Oh, Dr. Janger, look at that hand, go ahead, sorry. So just to point out, apropos of this conversation, the last bullet point on the memo does talk about when we would consider going remote. And I'm actually, I was just getting texts from our, our actual high school nurse, Sarah Lee has been tasked to the Board of Health and has been working with them really closely on this. And so not only are they monitoring and she monitoring, but she's someone we work with all the time. And so um, what I talk about at the end is that I think at, particularly at the high school, because the guidance from the CDC at the high school is different. Um, at the high school level, they say, if there are high levels of community transmission, you should consider returning to six feet, which would occasion us needing to go remote. Um, and um, in, in addition, I think that we are gonna look at trying to figure out a metric or an indicator for what is a high level of presence in the high school if we're getting a high case positive. Um, and then obviously, if there's any evidence that we're getting it in clusters and it's being transmitted in the high school, if we can't modify our practices to make that safe, we'd have to deal with that. So those three things are things that we're gonna sort of 
develop more guidelines on so that we are prepared when we come back, um, you know, to, to not be, get a bunch of information and then not have thought through how we're going to react to it. Great. Thank you. All right. Anybody else? Uh, Mr. Cardin. Sorry, I lost my cursor. Um, so uh, just following up on, on Dr. Alice and Anthony's point, um, we as a committee has never adopted the CDC guidelines as a standard that we are required or requiring our district to follow. This memo says when to consider going remote. Um, I don't support following the very conservative CDC guidelines. If Dr. Alice and Anthony wants to make a motion to require that, then I think that's something we can consider. But I, I don't think the message should be from the committee that as soon as we go into the red as a town, um, and that, that's a complicated calculation because I don't know what population figure you're using, Dr. Allison Ampey, um, but it, it's not a figure that I, don't, that I think our, our health department is monitoring, Dr. Bodie. So it's, it's, it's not something that, you, that you're monitoring the transmission, which is great, but I don't think you're monitoring the specific calculation that Dr. Allison Ampey is monitoring. Um, and I, I, I don't support using that as, as, a, as a requirement to go remote again. Thanks. Uh, Dr. Allison Ampey. Um, I am not prepared to make a motion off the cuff, uh, but I will consider it for our next meeting. Uh, I was assuming that because we're agreeing to do the things that the CDC, basically I was seeing it coming down from the state that the state has said, okay, that we're following CDC guidelines now and that's what we want you to be doing, that that sort of implied that that's where we were going. But if it's not, that's fine. In terms of the calculation, um, it's not a difficult calculation to do. You just look at the number of cases that we have in this in the town and then look a week earlier and how many cases and the difference is the new cases in a week. And you figure out how many cases that is per, um, 100,000 for the population. I can go through the math, but it's also on the CDC website on how to do it. Um, and, but Dr. Bodie, yes, this is a number. I think Mr. Cardin picked up something that I hadn't realized. This is a number I think we should be following. And uh, Dr. Jenger, I didn't see the bottom of your memo, so maybe it's in there. Uh, but uh, if not, this is something I think we should be looking at. Uh, and um, I can go into it offline. Uh, it, it's not it, it's not rocket science. So thank you. All right, anybody else? Uh, Ms. Exton? Do we need to pass a motion for May 5th to be a PD day? We do. Um, um, that was on my list. I was just not I'm sure sorry. because no, no, not at all. No, no, no. don't be sorry. Um, it wasn't on the agenda. So, but I think we can do it as part of this there. item. What do you think? Go ahead, Dr. Bodie. What do you got? Um, we did not put it on the agenda intentionally because it was something we needed to present tonight. So actually, I think there's really two motions. Um, does everyone agree where we are going with the high school plan? Because that's a vote, I think, that was taken for the middle schools and as well as for the elementary. That's one. And then two, no, we didn't take what we just heard it and said, okay. Okay, good. All right. But then you do need to vote on the planning day, which would be propo uh, the proposed day is Wednesday, May 5th. Yeah, we, we, we have lots of votes on planning days, something this committee takes very, our responsibilities around that very seriously. Um, so uh, I think uh, Ms. Exton, since you brought it up, would you like to make a motion around the planning day and then we can discuss it? Sure. Uh, I move that the school committee adopts uh, May Wednesday, May 5th as a planning day for the high school teachers. And, Right, okay. 
Second. Great discussion. Mr. Slickman. Yeah, I, I support this. Uh, I would like to offer a friendly amendment to say that the, this will be a no school planning day and uh, in the motion, just to make sure we're dotting our I's and crossing our T's. Are you good with that, Ms. Exton? Yep, thank you. Great. And this will push out the last day of school for our high school students in line with where we are at for our elementary and middle school students. Can so. someone remind me what day that means? Oh, come on. These are the hard questions. I think we're at Thursday. I actually get this wrong, but I think we're on Thursday of that week in June. June 24th. Okay. Yeah, we're at there Thursday, June 24th, 1130 AM release. There was confusion. I thought I'd go right to the horse's mouth. I'll change it on the high school calendar right now. All right, so uh, any more discussion on uh, the planning day? Seeing none, uh, I've lost my list. Ms. Exton? Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Mr. Schickman? Yes. Mr. Hayner? Yes. And I am also yes. And we'll get a communication out to the community about that as soon as possible, correct? Because it's it's getting it's getting I guess our elementary PD day has happened, but it's getting it's getting confusing with all these days. So we want to make sure that people people know what's happening. Okay, great. Um, anything else on uh, the high school, Dr. Allison Ampey, and then Mr. Schlickman. Sorry, I forgot to ask one of my questions, um, Dr. Janger. Going back to the open campus, I agree that it sounds like a good thing. Um, I also agree with Mr. Thielman that we plan to have students in the building um, attending school when we were building the high school, but we did not plan for open campus. And so I just want to think, is there anything, that means there may be more kids going back and forth, not in groups like classes or something, like in the back of the, to the fields and stuff. Is there anything that will make that better or safer? And I'm specifically wondering if you need like a field monitor or you know some, I'm thinking playground monitor, but for high school students, you know, anything uh, eyes in the back there uh, to make this work better and more safe for our students. So, um, so first, I mean, one thing to, under, to realize is that since we've been doing the departmental shift, there's been at least 100 students every hour coming and going out of the building, which is sort of more than would be usual because um, they're not usually all coming and going. So at any given period under this model, there would probably be two, 200 or so that would be unassigned. Most of those are probably going to stay in there in study halls or in the courtyards or in other places because they're comfortable places to be. So I don't know that there's going to be a ton more foot traffic. We are trying to sort of and two points. The building, as you know, is not well designed for stopping leakage. It has never been well designed for stopping leakage. There's 55 doors. Um, and um, the new building is actually designed to limit it to two main points of entry, um, which a lot of that design was intended to enable um, an open campus if the community wanted it at that point, because it's pretty easy to monitor kids going in and out. So what we are looking to do um, when we do this, and we're gonna have to deal with the realities of the building, is to funnel entrance and exit through the courtyard and then the uh, column entrance. And we will have an adult there supervising. And we have talked about whether we would use QR codes so students sign in and out of the building. So it helps us a little bit with contact tracing and knowing where kids are. We're already using scanners and doing that for signing into study halls. Um, another set of eyes would always be welcome. We are right now posted for one pair of professional to help us just with the general monitoring of the very large space and lots of kids. Um, to, so I will be honest, I am more concerned with kids congregating in unsupervised spaces in the building than I am with kids getting run over by construction 
equipment. The, as Mr. Thielman pointed out, the construction, the, the plan has been to have kids in the building in an occupied building. The construction folks are very responsive. We will sit down with them before we return to in-person to say, you know, you've been great around the smaller numbers, but we're going back to what we expected to be doing, which is a lot more kids around. So I think, um, you know, more, more paraprofessionals would always be great, but I don't know that we're limited right now by more than at this point, it's the ability to find folks that are well able to do it. So that we are, we do have plans to work in that direction. Okay, thank you. Let us know if you need more hands there. Uh, Mr. Schlickman. Uh, pass. Anybody else? Great, seeing none. Um, I don't remember. I don't remember. Um, got it, all right, we're ready. Go ahead. Do we need a motion for the return dates? We, we didn't for for K-8, okay. so. Well, okay. All right. I just want to make sure we, we uh, so parents will be notified of all the changes in the uh, PD, uh, PD day. Uh, thanks. Anybody, Mr. Thielman? I would just say by the vote we took, <clears throat> we basically took that vote to set the PD day, PD day with the assumption that school starts for seniors the next day. So we, I mean, we've kind of endorsed the plan in a sense. Great, anybody else? Okay, super. Dr. Jager, thank you so much for giving us such a, a solid presentation. Um, we're getting, we're getting, I do think we're actually getting better at this as a committee. Like we started with elementary and then we had middle school and I feel like we were, we were cruising along tonight and I really appreciate your, um, your your uh, willingness to to work with what we had questions about. So that's fantastic. There are many, many, many questions and you know it's helpful to get them because it helps us to clarify the process. I took a bunch of notes. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And we'll let you, we'll wave to you and say good night because it seems like there's a lot to do. And thank you so much for coming. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, the next item on the agenda is uh, the extended school year programming. Um, so this was an agenda item that we did um, sort of uh, so a brief presentation about what ESY looks like. Um, this was really helpful for me when Ms. Elmer did it last. Um, I think I looked back, Ms. Elmer, I think it was actually my first meeting as chair in June. So this is like a nice full circle moment. Um, and uh, it's, it's, you know, incredibly important programming for our students and for our families. And I think that it's really helpful for the committee to hear about it um, and to give the community the opportunity to hear any updates um, with how we're thinking about ESY for this summer. So I'll turn it over to you. Thank you for doing this. Sure. Julie. That's why you were able to recall it so quickly and pinpoint the presentation. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. So let's see, if it takes a second. And can I get a thumbs up if you can see it? Thumbs up. Okay, great. Um, all right, so um, as we mentioned last week, I think, or last set meeting, which is what prompted the request, is that the DESE had updated their guidance um, when they announced the return to full in-person and they've been rolling out additional information. So the week of March 15th, they um, clarified the expectation that extended school year which is an extension of this school year, um, would need to offer both a remote and an in-person option to families. Um, whereas other new programming, the Acceleration Academies and other um, summer, traditional summer school do not have that requirement. So um, that in order to you know, allow the students who have been remote for this year due to health and safety reasons to remain remote through the uh, summer. And so we um, sent out, uh, 
began sending out surveys uh, this past week or the week before and this week to families to find out what their intention is uh, to if they would prefer to um, remain remote for the ESY program if they're eligible or to come in person. Uh, we have so far about 100 responses. I checked this afternoon, um, the majority and 100 makes it easy to say this, 90% wanted in person. So we will likely the um, survey stays open until next week. So I'm assuming we will be having a very small uh, remote program this summer and the majority of students will be coming in person. Um, as I mentioned. Um, just to uh, give people general outline, as I've said before, this is an individual consideration for each student. So there is no set program like there is for our um, Title I reading or for some of the acceleration programs you've heard uh, Dr. McNeil speak about. But in general, the program runs July 12th through August 19th, Monday through Thursday, 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. Um, and then we have programs for the preschool students, they remain at uh, Parmenter unless they're rising to kindergarten and they'll go over to the Pierce School where they'll um, be with the other elementary age students, uh, rising sixth graders and the current seventh graders will uh, be at Gibbs and then rising ninth graders and 12th graders up through 12th graders will be at the high school. And that's generally where we've been holding the programs for the last few years. Anyway, last year being the exception that we just ran one program at Pierce. Um, you had asked about the timeline. Um, so we really start planning for ESY in the fall. Um, it's a year round uh, consideration and we will usually hire the extended school year coordinator or coordinators. This year, uh, Joy Schlanger will be the ESY coordinator for the preschool. She's the monotony preschool director and has been the coordinator for several years. Annalise Albdo. Alb Abdel Noor um, at the high school um, is going to be the coordinator for the elementary and secondary program. She coordinated the secondary program last year. Um, and then in the winter is when we start to post for the staff. So uh, Mr. Spiegel will put out uh, posting both internally and externally to begin hiring. And we're really doing that. We're continuing to do that now with the addition of the requirement for remote. We reposted because there were folks who initially didn't want to be in person and you know maybe interested now in doing it remote and also we just have to make sure that we have enough staff and we're continuing with that process i would say that we are i think it's no surprise um for the folks who are working in the buildings to say you know i think folks are kind of deciding if they want to break this summer or if they want to continue you know working through the uh summer but um you know, we are hiring up until right before the program starts, usually with TAs and that, but um, we are in that process right now. The other thing we are doing is we have the staff or the special ed liaisons um, inputting the information about who, which students are eligible for ESY and what their programming is. So we can also start to build those schedules. And then, as I mentioned, the program begins uh, July 12th. And so, um, just want to talk briefly, because I think this is what I did last year as well, is just to explain the criteria for ESY, because I know there's been questions about that, particularly during this pandemic year, you know, we have all talked a lot about learning loss and that, you know, all students are, you know, experiencing some regression. They've had both a break in instruction last year and this year in many cases has been somewhat abbreviated, you know, not being in school full time. However, the criteria for ESY, which is not changed, um, and it's very specific is to prevent substantial regret regression um, and to assist in recruitment of recruitment of skills that are being addressed in the IEP. So the understanding is that, like I said, all students will regress, but is a student likely to substantially regress in the absence of services over a break of um, time? That's really the standard that we're looking at. And ESY is not a replication of the school year. So if you got reading four times a week, ESY is not intended to just keep continuing like the school year. It's to prevent that 
backslide in skills um, significantly. So you may get two sessions. The recommendation be for two sessions. So you're maintaining the skills that you have and not, you know, falling back substantially um, behind your peers. Or if it were to take you a long time to recoup in this in the fall, everyone comes back. We know the first four to six weeks of school is a lot of review and recovery for all students. You know, is a student likely to take twice as long to regain the skills they had? the previous spring. So those are really the standards that we're looking at. And I've just linked um, where you can find that both on our website as well as um, the regulations. So that's kind of, you know, the big piece of it. I know you have some questions. One thing I did wanna, um, I didn't put a slide on here. I know that um, Ms. Exton had a question around transportation. So transportation is something that again, is individual to a student and is it's in their IEP. So if they are a student who requires transportation to access their education, then they are, they get transportation to the summer program or the ESY program. We do run a bus um, in the summer that's open to anybody in ESY that'll stop at each of the elementary schools in the morning. So parents can drive to their neighborhood school to get picked up there, but that's not a requirement. That's just something we do. Um, and with all of our bus runs, those are because that bus list, you know, they're making routes up to 48 hours to the start of the program is when they're going to be finalizing those lists. So I know sometimes parents aren't sure what time they're getting picked up, but that's because, you know, our director of transportation is working with his drivers to make sure that that list is up to date. It's the most efficient route going through town. Any addition that's added to that can change the route up. So um, folks wouldn't hear about that until 48 hours before the program um, were to start. Great, thank you, Ms. Elmer. Uh, questions for the from the committee about uh, Ms. Elmer's presentation, uh, Mr. Cardin, and then Ms. Exton. Thank you. Um, so yes, the other comment we get repeatedly year after year is, is not just the bus, but also um, confusion about you know which school they're supposed to go to, or or you know who the teacher is going to be. And I realize that a lot of those details fall into place, unfortunately, at the last minute. But um, you know. I, it's great that we have the coordinators in place this early because sometimes we don't even have a coordinator. Um, but if we could, you know, make sure, you know, we're, we're doing the best we can to make sure that families have, you know, a week notice in advance of where they're supposed to be and who their teacher will be, that would be fantastic. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Um, I, I will just add that um, the, the location is usually set. So I'm surprised by that feedback, um, unless it's unclear about a rising um, student, but um, we do send letters out. So um, we'll make sure that we do that in most timely fashion. As you said, we can have meetings up to the last day of school, um, an IEP meeting. So it could be decided that day that that student is eligible. So it is definitely up to the last minute, but that's important feedback. Thank you. Ms. Exton. Thank you. Um, thank you for this presentation. I think it's really helpful for for me as a new member and the um, just the community to get a an overview of this. Um, one of my questions comments was um, the same as Mr. Cardin's, um, and I think just adding to that and hearing, you know, while some students might get ESY in their IEP on the last day of school, that's not true for most of the students. And so, for as much as students who, who already know they're going to be eligible for ESY, um, the sooner that they can find out who their teacher is going to be, who their service providers are going to be. Um, you know, I, I know you know very well that um, students um, receiving special education ESY are, you know, particularly transitions are going to be hard, new situations are going to be hard for them, new adults are going to be challenging. And so, as much as the staffing is hard, I think it's really important as best as you can to give them as much notice as um, as possible. Um, and then I just I I have a I had a suggestion and I shared it with you before, but I also want to share it here. Um, I think this this information is important for families to understand and that staffing is really hard and things like that. So I just wanted to suggest potentially having some kind of either at a CPAC meeting or some other time sharing this presentation and making sure or, or a modified one, whatever you wanna do um, to make sure that families um, have an understanding of, of this process and when to expect to hear about services and transportation and, and things like that. 
Um, and then my, my question is, I understand that you there's a survey at the end of ESY sent out to families every year. And I'm just curious how that information is used to improve um, or change or modify things um, the subsequent year. Thank you. Sure, so our um, coordinators and we're lucky that they actually have been relatively consistent over the last three, few years. Um, Ms. Nolan worked with Ms. Um, Abdel Noor. So there, what, you know, last year, so there was a transition between that and she was the previous coordinator. Um, so they, they review that information, look at what that means for class sizes, you know, whether we also try to coordinate with some of the other programming that is going on in the district. So I know that one year, you know, we were able to coordinate with Mr. Coleman and his math program so that we could schedule math at the end of the day so that students who were going to stay to go to his math program who were already coming in at that time. So we use that information really in the fall, as I mentioned, when we're starting to when we hire the coordinators to really start looking in that and planning for that. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Allison Ippy. Thank you. Um, so I miss anything that was discussed last meeting. So I'm sorry, I may be repeating something, but to me, it seems so first, I agree that it's helpful to get information out as quickly as possible. But also, whenever you have something like this, where it is having to go later than perhaps the families would like, um, and maybe coming out in pieces, you know, they know the program, but they don't know the best schedule and stuff. If there's a clear point person that can be contacted and, you know, maybe that the role of that person is just to say, you're right, we're working on the buses, but we've got a couple new people and we're having to rearrange the stops or something just so that they know they haven't missed anything and they have someone to talk to. Um, so uh, I'm thinking that that can make it at least more tolerable, even if they don't have the information. So thank you. Sure, and, and that individual would be the ESY coordinator. They're listed as the contact person for um, all this stuff, but you know, we certainly get calls to our office as well. And um, Mary, Mary Camioni or Mary Morocco um, now um, will also field questions and direct them to the ESY coordinators. Anybody else? Mr. Schlickman. Admittedly, uh, it may be off to topic, but I'd like to know what plans we have for uh, second language learners over the summer. Uh, that is the agenda item after the survey. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Great, thank you so much, Ms. Elmer. Uh, the next item is the survey results for students and staff. This is something that Dr. McNeil presented at a CIA meeting, uh, I don't know, weeks ago, I don't think months ago. Um, and the direction from the subcommittee was that it would be helpful if he provided a condensed version for the full uh, committee. So uh, I'm glad that we're able to do this uh, tonight. I'm, working off all the last bits on my list. So this was certainly one of them that was pending. So Dr. McNeil, thank you for putting this together and uh, we're, we're ready. Thank you, uh, Ms. Morgan. So I'm not going to go through the slide decks because I sent it out to school committee members and it's a wealth of information. And so I'm just going to focus on some highlights uh, from all three surveys, the um, student, the students in grades uh, three through five, students in grades uh, six to 12, and then the staff survey. And then I'll open it up for questions or comments after. And if you have questions about the, the data that you receive, I'll be happy to respond to them. So the overview for the, I wanna start by, by going through the, the um, response rates for each one of the surveys. And let me pull up my notes right now. So 
So the response rate for the elementary schools, uh, which is grades three through five, all seven of the uh, elementary schools, the average was 89%. The response rate for the middle schools, which would include Gibbs and Otteson was 76.1%. And the high school response rate was 12.5%. So as you can see from those rates, the older the students um, are, the less of a response rate we were able to get. So when I give the, the different um, results, I mean, you look at the results in the slide deck that I gave you, you can kind of conceptualize, you know, what the bulk of the responses, where they came from, especially at the secondary level. So, um, just looking at some of the highlights, I'll give the highlights. The way that I organize the slide decks is there was like six components of the survey in which students receive questions. And I'll just highlight some of those um, sections, those components, and I'll give the highlights under those, uh, those different section headers. So for the student survey results, which I will, um, use both the three through five and six through 12, looking at student relationships, some of the highlights were that 90% of the students in grades three through five reported that they can access an adult if they needed help at that moment. And then uh, uh, for students in grades six through 12, the, uh, it was 87% of the students reported that they can access an adult if they needed help right at that moment. Under positive feelings, which was another component of both surveys, student surveys, students in grades through five, 85% uh, of them reported that they felt safe, which really goes to our primary goal for the year was to keep our students, you know, feeling safe, especially during the pandemic and healthy. And I think we were able to accomplish that. And that's the way that the students were feeling. 59% uh, of the students in grades three through five felt that they reported that they felt loved, and 69% of the students in grades two through five reported that they felt happy, which is, you know, goes to what we're trying to do with SEL and provide a safe and welcoming environment, uh, even though we're in a pandemic, and even though that we're looking at different learning models. Um, and then in, for students in grades six to 12, 87% of the students, uh, I'm sorry, 87% of students in grades six to, six to 12 reported that they felt safe, and 67% of the students in grades six to 12 reported that they felt loved. So, you know, that definitely goes to, you know, our parents who are working in partnership with us um, and with the teachers and the amount of attention that they were able to provide to students, despite the fact that we're in a pandemic and we're dealing with different learning models. For the component of student engagement, 82% of our students in grades three through five report that they are putting in quite a bit of effort or a great deal of effort into their classes. So that was very great to see how that students are trying very hard. And 79% uh, of students in grades six through 12 are reporting that they're putting quite a bit of effort or a great deal of effort into their classes. So again, looking at that student engagement making sure that we have students that are motivated to learn. And it looks like, you know, based upon those results that, that, that we're able to accomplish that goal. Looking at the cultural awareness and action, uh, which was another component of both of, of all three surveys, but for the students, we had 63% of our students in grades three through five report that their school helps students speak out against racism. And 56 of our students percent of our students in grades six to 12 report that their school helps students speak out against racism. So that was good to see because that, you know, we're, we're definitely uh, focusing on creating an anti-racist learning environment for all students and staff. And we've made that a priority this year. And there's lots of different things that are going on within the district to address uh, racism and um, prejudice and, we put a, a, a great deal of effort and also, you know, with our curriculum audit in order to make sure that we're providing the resources that students need in order to learn about uh, people from different cultures. So that that's kind of like the highlights of the student surveys. And that's not to say that, you know, we understand, you know, looking at the, the student survey results on a whole, 
uh, and a, from a compre comprehensive perspective that, you know, we know that there was a lot of things that we needed to focus on as we move forward. And hopefully as we give the next administration of the Panorama uh, student survey that we'll see those um, improvements in various areas. Moving on to the staff survey, some of the highlights. Um, uh, I would like to uh, start with the uh, component of well being, which is one of the components of the survey. 71% of staff reported that they felt safe at work. Again, going back to our primary goal for this year uh, during a pandemic to make sure our students and staff felt safe. And I think we were able to do that. So it was very pleasing to see that staff felt safe. Uh, 96 of staff percent of staff report that their that their work matters to them quite a bit or a tremendous amount. And so, you know, we definitely know that we have very dedicated staff and that they're very passionate about what they do. And they're very concerned about the, the health and the well-being of our students. And they put forth a lot of effort in order to make sure that we're meeting the needs of all of our students. 93% of staff report that they felt like the work that they were doing was quite meaningful or extremely meaningful. So again, going to you know their passion for what they're doing, and I think that's something that you can't you can't teach that you can't provide professional development to promote that. That is that it has to do with um, our administrators and our staff working together to make sure that we're doing the best we can to make it through this pandemic and provide the best level, the highest level of quality of education to our students. So I, I applaud our staff for their passion and their dedication and their resolve throughout this whole entire year, because it's been a very difficult year. So I have nothing but a kudos for all the staff and administrators working together. Looking at cultural awareness and action, 82% of staff responded that they frequently or almost always think about students from different races, cultures, and ethnicities, uh, what they experience. And so I think that was, uh, Great to see because there's a there's definitely a will and a um, uh, a motivation from our staff to make sure that they are working towards developing those culturally responsive teaching practices and trying to make sure that they're thinking about their own bias and and working towards again a primary goal of ours to create an anti-racist uh, learning environment for all students. So those are some of the highlights. Uh, from the surveys, from all three surveys, and I'll open it up to questions and comments at this time. Is this okay? Great, thank you. Yeah, it's fine. Uh, thank you, Dr. McNeil. Uh, questions from the committee? Hold on just a second, sweetie. Okay, seeing none. Thank you, Dr. McNeil. We did see this at CIA, so. Um, Thank you so much for doing this for all of us. Um, okay, the next item on the agenda is summer school and ELL, ELL summer programming, Dr. McNeil. Yes, yeah, so um, I just wanna start off by saying that um, again, uh, this is something that we have put a lot of time and effort into thinking about, about how we're going to provide students who have a need uh, access to, uh, academic support over the summer. And we're gonna, we're gonna you know, our, our primary goal is to replicate what we did last year. And that means that we are utilizing our Title I funds to definitely target those students that are receiving target, I mean, Title I services throughout the year. Uh, we're, we're using different sources of data in order to identify who those students are. Um, and we're, you know, Definitely conferring with our math interventionists, our reading specialists, our principals, um, and teachers in order to identify those students and make sure that we have a comprehensive list. But I also want to say that we're, we're going to also go beyond just offering uh, support for our students who are currently receiving Title I services and any of those students who are not necessarily receiving Title I services in those buildings that have been identified, but also expanding into other buildings who are not necessarily receiving Title I funding. Uh, so we're trying to have a very um, inclusive program that's going to, you know, that's going to, you know, take in all the students that we feel that need support. So our primary focus is to definitely make sure we're offering that programming to those students. With that said, 
looking at some of the details of the type of program that we're going to uh, you know, um, provide is, so we're looking at to replicate what we did last year. So it'd be a five week program for literacy and math at the elementary level that will um, uh, uh, take in consideration those rising kindergarten through fifth graders. And it will be a half day program primarily scheduled for Tuesday through Thursday. And the groups will be you know, around four or five. Um, and then you know, looking at what we're trying to do right now is we're trying to um, identify staff uh, in order to, who are interested in teaching in that program. And we're also, we've sent out invitations to those students who have been identified to those families to see whether or not they would be interested in sending their kids to the program. Um, and so we're also trying to also take in consideration what we did last year by offering a remote a part of this program, a version of it. So we wanna make sure that we're taking out any types of barriers that may be there for our students and provide access. So we're looking at an in-person and remote version of it, um, trying to make sure that we're doing in-person as much, as much as possible but understanding that there may be uh, families who still might want to have the remote version. So uh, again, it's a five week program, Title I, extended Title I program, I would call it, replicating what we did last year at the elementary level would be K through five, and it would, um, take in con it would focus on math and literacy. Looking at the middle school level, which we also offered a, a middle school program last year, again, a five week program, uh, right now, we're talking to our middle school principals in order to identify, um, you know, staff and students that could take advantage of this program. And so we're really in the planning phases at the middle school level and the high school level. So that's where we are. But we're going to definitely work to, to offer something very similar to what we did last year. And so I will be coming out with more information within the next couple of weeks in order as we uh, solidify these plans. At the middle school level, we have meetings uh, planned for next week. And then we also have to um, work with our high school principals for the credit recovery program, which will be primarily be the, the way that we're gonna offer the support for students uh, who need uh, that, that um, credit recovery over the summer. So I'll open it up for questions and comments right now. Thank you, Dr. McNeil. Uh, questions for Dr. McNeil, Mr. Shipman. Yeah, I, I want oh, to I'm sorry, I, I forgot the ELL. I'm so sorry. Yeah. ELL, um, we are trying to offer a program, a comprehensive program uh, over the summer. We've, I, you know, we're working to identify a space. And I, I'm sorry, Mr. Schlipman, I, I, I totally forgot. So I'm going to definitely. So I'm working with Ms. Busesi, who is our director of ELL. And she's right now uh, seeing what teachers are available. Uh, in order to staff the program, but I will say it's very challenging uh, after this year because as as we ran into the same uh, you know the same issue last year, we had teachers that were just you know they just didn't have the bandwidth in order to uh, work in a summer program. So we're kind of running into the same issue this year. Again, we're we're looking at trying to maybe definitely starting with prior prioritizing an in person program, but if we think that the staff are more willing to do it in a remote version, we're definitely going to keep that open. So we're, you know, reaching out to families right now to see who's interested and also trying to see what, what staff members we have interested. I, I, I just want to say, to my mind, there's nothing more critical than providing summer services to, to English learners uh, because they do not have the opportunity for high level uh, English interactions at home because they're coming from a second language environment. Uh, we, it, it is essential. We cannot go this year and say, well, nobody wanted to do it. If we don't have the staff in Arlington, we have to go and recruit elsewhere. We've got to make this program run because this is a critical, critical group of students. So I would urge uh, the leadership here to not only identify space, identify space quickly, but make quick identification of which teachers are able to do it from within our staff 
And if we don't have staff uh, in Arlington that's able to do it, that we need to go out and hire and recruit because we must have this program. This is the most essential program, summer program in my mind. And I just don't want to see it fall apart again this year. Well, I, I don't want to say that it fell apart last year. We did have a, a version of it. It was not a, as comprehensive, but we did have staff work with students in small groups remotely, and they did meet with them throughout the summer. Uh, I, I, I share your same concern, um, but I also want to make sure that the, the individuals that we're putting in front of our students are also qualified and are able to provide the level of support and the quality of education that we're looking for. So I understand what you're saying, and we're doing the best that we can in order to recruit a staff to do so. Um, and we will uh, definitely think outside the box and try to, if we have to go outside the district, we will. Um, but again, I, even if you go outside the district, I don't know how many people you're going to get to be to work in the summer program as at you know at this point in time. So I just want to make sure that I'm I understand and I share your same concern, and we're doing the best that we can in order to staff these programs. I mean, if you need to come back to us if we need more money to run this thing to attract teachers, if we need its incentives, if whatever we need to get this running. I, I, I want to push for it and I want to make sure that we don't do anything as a school committee that's a barrier to having a world class second language learner program over the summer. No, I, I no. the school committee has always been very supportive when we've asked for resources. And so that's not the barrier. Uh, and it, it's not a funding sort. It's not a funding. It literally is, this year has been very, very difficult. And I just wanna make sure that I'm, I'm saying that for our teachers and that you know we want our teachers to come into the fall refreshed and ready to go through because next year is gonna be just as challenging. So I understand what you're saying, but I also understand what teachers are going through because I hear them and, I, and I, we meet with them and we, I talk to them and I understand what they're going through. So this is not because, like I said, in a survey, they want to do it. It's the fact that whether or not they have the bandwidth to do it over the summer. No, I understand this. I really do understand this. I've taught, I've run summer programs. I've worked in summer programs. Uh, it, it, it's exhausting. And if, if the summer program goes too late into the year, you really don't have enough time to decompress between the time of the, the end of the summer program and coming back to school in September. Uh, I understand all of this. But if we don't have the capacity within the district, maybe we also need to make sure that we have uh, more ELL staff uh, so that we have greater capacity, lessen the burden during the year, have people who are more refreshed and more able to go work the summer. Because this is, to me, this is our biggest priority right now over the summer. Absolutely, it is. It is, and, and, and with all due respect, I understand that you have experience, but I don't think any of us have experienced working through a pandemic before. So I do wanna make sure that that is a variable that's different than any other given year because any other given year, we haven't had uh, a, a challenge of recruiting staff to work in the summertime. But, yeah, I, I understand that, I, I really do. But I also, I'm also looking at those kids and I, this, is, this, is a, this is a cohort that need more intensive, more focused English instruction because that's what's going to get move them forward within our system. Um, so, uh, Dr. Alsanby, and then, but I have a question first. Um, so, for Dr. McNeil and maybe Mr. Spiegel, what are our, what is our ability or to capacity to be flexible around? salary for these summer positions? What are our, like, what, what are our obligations? Um, and how can we make it more, um, potentially more desirable? Can, can I just say that it's not a salary thing? It really isn't. I mean, I think that, and, and if, uh, you know, if uh, Jenna can chime in here, I, I, I really would like to have her you know, share some understanding as, as what we're talking, it's not a funding, it's not funding, it's not salary. We can offer all the money in the world, but if people are burned out, they're burned out. 
And I just want Jenna, could you please uh, provide some insight to this? Yeah, what, what's going through my mind is when I, I also read your um, slide deck that you sent to the staff this afternoon, and there was a question about how often did you feel exhausted at work? And I think it was something like 89% felt, you know, at least somewhat, or I don't remember exactly what the, um, but it was a huge number of, of staff feeling exhausted. And, you know, I'm, I'm looking at, I'm going to do some summer fun stuff, but this year I can't, I can't put into words how different this year is in terms of looking into the summer and kind of what we need to get ready for next year. So I appreciate Dr. McNeil bringing that up. And I absolutely share the concern for our ELL students. Um, and I just, I know the district's doing the best they can. So, so we don't have, like, I mean, there, there are, generally speaking, there are plate, there, there, there are dollar amounts where people will make different decisions like that's just how people like eventually that there comes that place so i hope that if you know if this is really a priority and certainly there's no obligation that any of our teachers choose to do this this summer but we can continue to incentivize it if it is really a priority and if we're going you know going to continue to spend money on it there are ways to make it more appealing for people um, if, and if we can do that, I think, you know, I agree with Mr. Schlickman that it should be something that, that you know, that we try to do. So, uh, Dr. Allison Ampey and then Mr. Thank you. Um, so, a couple things. One, um, I totally understand about burnout and can guess that that's how many, many people are, I mean, many, many of our teachers and staff are feeling right now. Um, so I would wonder if there's any way that we can play with the schedule where like they're only teaching half of a program, you know, you have people doing team teaching. One person teaches the first two and a half weeks, the second person teaches the second two and a half weeks, so they're both not doing the full thing. Um, and second, whether, I don't know our numbers, but whether we could combine with another district and maybe both bring staffing in um, and be able, you know, maybe they're having problems too, but they can put together half a program. We can put together half a program. We bring all the students together and, and do that. Anyway, um, just trying to come up with some other ideas uh, to help us achieve the goal. Um, but the other question I have, and I'm gonna have to start driving, so I'm just gonna be listening. Um, when I read the DESI, the new DESI guidance, to me, it seemed to suggest that all students, not just these students who definitely are, are in high need, but that all students receive as much in-person learning during the summer. And I was wondering, is there somewhere else where they make it more clear that it's just referring to special education students, ELL, Title I, et cetera, or is it really everybody? It is everybody, and we're thinking outside the box and how to provide, uh, you know, activities. And so we're thinking of like for our, you know, for enrichment. So what I hear you talking about is the enrichment. What can we offer to the students who aren't struggling, who are progressing, uh, typically, and or above? So we're looking at for literacy, coming up with like an activity calendar, an activities calendar. You know, definitely looking at our enrichment page and very, having very targeted, specific you know, activities that um, students can access over the summer. They'll have their Chromebook. And then we have our online platforms that we have invested in that will be made available. And our licenses go from August to August. But I think that, you know, again, as I talk to you about us having problems staffing you know, the program for students that are in high need of support over the summer. I don't want us to compete against ourselves and offering an enrichment program. And then you have staff that you would, you, you know, so we have, to prior, we have to have priorities. And so right now our priority is to provide staffing for our students who are in need. And then definitely considering our, our students who are, who would like to have enrichment and then providing them with resources that they can access over the summer that doesn't necessarily rely upon 
you know, having a staff member. We think outside the box again. We're saying maybe we can have a check-in once a week with a staff member, you know, after they do some of the activities and they can, you know, summarize what, you know, the students have accomplished during the week. So we're trying to think outside the box in many different ways and also be very respectful of our teachers who have gone through a lot this year. And like Jenna pointed out, our staff survey has, has shown that. And so when I go into buildings, I think the one thing our teachers want us to be able to just amplify over and over again is how much we appreciate them. And knowing that, you know, they put, they put it all on the, all on, they, they left nothing, they left nothing on the field. I mean, everything they, they, they left it on the field, you know, this year, they really have. And so, you know, we definitely are, you know, trying to reach out to teachers and make sure that we have these programs available for our students. Okay. I wasn't necessarily just talking about enrichment and stuff. I think this year, a lot of students may not be at where they might have expected to be at the end and but not necessarily falling into the really need summer. I mean, that we would ordinarily have considered them for summer school. Anyway, I was trying to understand the DESE guidance and what it's trying to say and whether there was something else um, about it, but um, I'll let someone else ask questions now. Thank you. Dr. Bodhi. We certainly want to have students supported this summer. That, that's, a, that's a given. Uh, DESE guidance um, is, is asking districts to, to figure out how you can do that. One of the things that we have, we have a lot of assessments that we are able to determine where students are in terms of benchmarks in these two important areas of literacy and math. And, um, one of the things that we're looking at with, the, with this summer programming is to look at the students first who have not, that maybe not our benchmark. Um, you know, the, we do know where kids could be, should be at this time of the year. So we, and I think your suggestion, Dr. Allison Appy, is a great one because um, about the, the schedule, you know, having a smaller, um, you know, maybe less time that, that uh, weeks that would be committed. That, that may, we've looked at that actually, and that's a possibility. We'll just have to see uh, if that's workable. The, um, the issue is that we, we're, we're actually trying to maybe do a little bit too much, to be honest. Um, the, the Department of Education does not require uh, for any program except for ESY that you offer remote and you offer in person. Last year, we had a lot of success with the remote, but I think, um, I think this year, if we were to lean toward either one of them, it would be go to in-person because I, I think we all understand that we've had a lot of screen time for our students and particularly the students that may not be at benchmarks. They, they need more of the in-person. So, that has been the priority. We're going to have a program similar to last year. We're going to identify those students. And if we have uh, additional um, capacity, we certainly would open it up a little wider. I think one of the things that uh, we've talked about before, but the platforms we have bought for the district that we've made available actually are excellent in helping students um, with review. Um, a particular note is our math one, Dreambox. And that we're gonna make that available to all students this summer. Now, it requires some level of parents saying you need to do, you know, your, your half hour or several times a week. You know, it's different obviously than saying, okay, you've gotta be a school from, you know, uh, nine o'clock to, to 11, 30, 12 o'clock. It, it is different. And I realize it's putting more on parents to make sure the students do that. But um, I think the one thing we've learned this year is we have a very 
um, supportive and uh, parents that will really um, take advantage of that this summer. So I, I, we do lean toward the in-person and I know Dr. McNeil would like to have remote and it's just really a question whether we have the, the, the staffing to do both, but our first priority is in-person. And um, I, think as, I think we can give you a, an update as we go along. Um, and we, we, we actually do pay our teachers very well. I will also point out that Summer Fund is an Arlington Public School program. And um, there are lots of programs that we offer in, that, in Summer Fund, which, which is of an enrichment nature. Um, so I just want to, I, I think we're going to have, it's hard to say um, how many people we'll have. We've had very high numbers, thousands of, thousands of registrations in the past. Um, doesn't mean that we have thousands of kids every day. It's just the number of students that have taken advantage of this. Um, so we will look at whether a reduced schedule can work in attracting teachers. But the main thing is we wanna make sure we have the summer programming, both for our students that are not a benchmark, our ELL students, and of course we're gonna have ESY. So let me also say that there are teachers that are leaning towards the remote option uh, as opposed to being in person. So, you know, again, we're having, you know, we're reaching out to teachers and, and trying to figure out what we can do in order to have them work uh, on a consistent basis and work with the students. So, you know, like Dr. Bodhi said, we're trying to consider in person, but we know that we might have to offer that remote option, which I indicated earlier in my summary. Um, so I, I just want to make sure that I put that in there. And I also want to, I want to add that, you know, myself, Matt Coleman and Deb Perry, we met with Jen Rothenberg, who runs the Summer Fund program in order to see what we could do in, in order to partner with Summer Fund in order to offer some of the classes for like for the enrichment part. And, and, I, and I'm only saying enrichment because I know that some students may not be where they normally would be, but for the learning loss that happened during the pandemic. And again, we're using all the different um, metrics we have in order to have a very comprehensive list. But that was also problematic because she has a program that she's trying to run. And, you know, we were all going to even say that we'll, you know, do something with the fees in order to lessen the, the burden on parents. But again, it was, it, was a, it was space. And again, it's competing against each other for, um, you know, the, the, the students. And so we didn't want to take away from her program. She did say that we could utilize some of the internal structures that she has, you know, as it relates to, you know, the administration, things that have to happen when you offer a summer program. But she suggested that we offer it outside the dates of summer funds. So we have tried to think about all different options. And, I, and I'm, I'm still going to continue to try. I'm just giving you and um, overview of where we are right now, and maybe in a couple of weeks that will change. So I just wanna make sure that we're gonna continue to work. Mr. Slipman, we're gonna continue to try to make sure that we look at all different alternatives for all students, because we definitely know how important it is. Anybody else for Dr. McNeil, Mr. Thielman, and then Ms. Eckton? Thank you. Um, so for the ELL program, how many, uh, I mean, how many teachers would you need to hire? Well, we, we normally, I'm, I think we're about, about between four and five to four run five. a comprehensive program. Okay. So, um, and, uh, and, and for the uh, summer enrichment program that we ran last year, how many teachers did we hire? You mean for the Title I extended program? Yeah, the Title I extended program. For the K five, we were looking. We were, we we ran about. Um, I have to look back, but we had uh, four groups a day for um, ELA, and uh, I have to look back for math. 
Um, but it was it was it ended up being um, around nine. Uh, we're looking to hire between math and ELA. So we're looking to hire somewhere around twenty teachers or twenty teachers or so for the summer. Is that about right? It's even more than that because we're looking at offer a middle school program. So, okay. you know, we're trying to. I can't give you the. I can. I, I can. I don't want to give you inaccurate numbers. Okay. I will. I, I can get that information to you. I can email it to you as to the number that we actually need to run, like what we ran last year. And I didn't. I didn't do a. I didn't. Um, I will. I can get the information that we, the number of staff that we had in our program from last year, and I can send that to you. Okay, it'd be, it'd be good to know the numbers. Um, I mean, my thinking is between the American Recovery Act money that is is supposedly designated to city uh, to states and then to uh, communities for summer programming, plus any funding we may have that is not used in our budget, there there may be enough money to um, you know offer some very competitive, highly competitive uh, uh, wages to the 25 or 30 teachers in from our district or outside of our district who might want to teach this summer. So I, I think this is a solvable problem given the funding that we have in our budget and the funding that is supposed to be available through the American uh, Rescue Plan, I guess the Recovery Act or Rescue Plan, whatever President Biden signed a few weeks ago. Um, with that an acronym, I mean, I, I, I think there's the funding available to solve the problem. I understand recruiting 25 or 30 teachers to do that over the summer is a challenge. You know, hiring talented personnel anytime to do anything is always, uh, you know, recruiting and finding people is always a challenge in any organization at any time. But we may have the money to provide an incentive to, to hire people. Uh, that's all I want to say. I just want to kind of point that out there. Maybe the resources here to solve this problem. Uh, and I, I think we can do that if we use federal, state, uh, federal and our money. Absolutely. And I hope that you're right. And like I said, we're going to continue to offer those incentive, incentives to teachers uh, in order to attract them into the program. Uh, and I know that Mr. Spiegel <laughs> is probably thinking, well, we also have to make sure that we're um, being, you know, have an equitable, what we offer that, you know, we have the ESY program and we have other programs. So we don't want to, you know, overcompensate in one program, which will make it inequitable for other programs. So I just want to point that out, but we do have a, a, a fee structure that we follow. And uh, if we need to sweeten the pot, I'm sure that we can do so. And I'll have to work with Mr. Spiegel in order to make sure that you know, we're doing it in, in line and, and not trying to, um, again, you know, uh, pull staff from another program because um, we are competing all for the same resources. Yeah, right? I, I get that. I, I get that. We don't, I mean, there has to be equity between all the pro programs, but I think you can use the funding, district funding plus American rescue sure. plan money Absolutely. together to pay everybody the same and pay them more. I mean, Absolutely, I think, which, I think, which, which that type of funding allowed us to go beyond our normal Title I programming from last right. year. And so that's why we were able to have an extended Title I program last year because and have a very extensive offering from last year um, because we did take advantage of those funds. So I just want to point that out. Yeah, so and at thank some you point in time. Go ahead. Sorry. sorry, go ahead. And at some point in time, it would be good for us, for the district, for the school committee to understand what what we're eligible to get from this from the federal government with this new new plan absolutely i, I appreciate the suggestion and we'll like i said we're going to continue to you know speak with teachers and uh try to make sure that we can find out what incentives and what how can we structure the program so they they will participate okay thank you mm -hmm. uh ms exton and then mr schickman So I, I, I appreciate how much you're supporting the teachers and how um, tiring and exhausting this year has been. I also agree with um, my committee members that if there's a way to increase the pay to incentivize teachers um, or others to, to, to teach in this program this summer, um, I would support that. I, have, I just have some questions about the sort of the goals of the programming and some of this is to help the community understand and then some of this is to help 
sort of the the parity between ESY um, and and this Title I extension program. So as Ms. Elmer said, ESY is very clearly by law um, to prevent substantial regression. What are what are we what are the goals or what are we looking at for this Title I programming in terms of of our students? Is it to prevent more regression from where students are now, or are we really trying to close a gap of where they are compared to a benchmark and we wanna move them toward that benchmark during the summer program? Absolutely, so we have, we, have, we have to be very careful when we talk about, you know, the different goals of the different programs. So I appreciate your question. So, you know, the way I like to talk about it and the way we talk about it with the curriculum leaders and the administrators who are running the program is targeted instruction. So, you know, collecting the data, understanding, getting that profile of that student, understanding where they need the support and being able to provide that support and identify those skills that they need in order to move them forward and, and get them prepared uh, and, and to close the gap. You know, again, within that inherently is that you're gonna prevent regression, but you're also, you know, wanna target those students in those small groups in order to identify the skills that they need in order to move forward uh, with their understanding of the content. So it's definitely, you know, preventing regression at the same time of trying to move them forward. So I guess my follow-up question to that is, and I don't know if this is to Ms. Elmer or, or to you, Dr. McNeil, um, this is a little nuanced, but for a student who um, receives special education, may or may not qualify for ESY, but is not meeting their benchmark, for example, in reading, and it may or may, may not be due to their disability, are they being considered for the Title I program? Would they, yes. just how does that um, come together? So that's a very good question. So we have reading specialists, we have math interventionists that provide general education support throughout the year. And our reading specialists see students on an IEP and they also see students in the general education, uh, curric you know, in the general education uh, program. So we are, like I said before, we're looking at those students who are already receiving Title I services. And we have, I, we have identified buildings that receive Title I funding. And then because of the funding that uh, Mr. Thielman pointed out, we're able to go beyond our Title I uh, schools and extend it. So we're also looking at those students who are receiving math interventionists and reading uh, support throughout the year. And those, they, that may be the profile of student that you just described, a student who may be on an IEP or have a goals and objectives in a different area, but they also may be struggling in reading. And so they're not receiving, you know, special education support for the reading, but they're seeing a reading specialist. And so, you know, we're trying to definitely, you know, like I said before, offer what we off, you know, provided last year in the same, um, with, with the same intensity because last year was very successful and um, we had a lot of students participate, you know, probably because the, you know, the camps were closed or people were feeling some anxiety about sending their students to a camp. Um, there's lots of different variables, but we had a very high participation rate. And I do believe it was par partly because we were offer offering it remotely as well. So with the combination of people not wanting to send their kids to camp and also the remote, we were able to get a high participation rate. Thank you. I hope you can staff this because I think it's an important uh, program. Thank you. I, I do as well. And I want everybody to know that that's our goal is to staff this program and replicate what we did last year. Uh, Mr. Schiffman? Yeah, I just want to put for the record for us to be thinking as we look at the uh, AEA contract for next year, it sounds to me like we should be exploring uh, adding some 11 month teaching positions into the contract and into the budget so that we have a secure source of highly qualified teachers who are committed to working uh, a summer program uh, in either special ed or particularly in, in, in EL. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Cardin. 
Thanks, and uh, thank you, Dr. McNeil, for all the efforts. Um, uh, my my main concern is that um, you know there's there's lots of talk about summer school. You know, the president mentioned it. Um, the governor has mentioned it. Uh, the DESE guideline is guidelines are pretty vague, and and I'm a little concerned that there's going to be another <laughs> requirement coming down and another pivot required. Um, and and I. I don't know what the demand is in the community for summer school, um, but I, I, I do think that we should be building as big of a program as we possibly can. Um, you know, people will start hearing about it from this meeting and from from hopefully from their principals. Um, you know that that people are being selected for this program. But what if what if my child is has not been selected and I think they've um, fallen behind? Uh, what are my options? So I, I, you know, besides just doing Dreambox on their own, um, uh, you know, again, I understand that our staff is exhausted, um, but I, I do think we need to to look as big as we possibly can. Uh, and I think you're hearing that message, you know, across the board. Thank you. Yes, I, and I agree with you. I want to make sure we offer something for all students. But I want to also point out, we're not doing anything different as it relates to the title. We are doing something different as it relates to the Title I. If this was not a pandemic year and we weren't getting the federal funds, we utilize the Title I money for those Title I schools to have, you know, this Title I programming. So I want, to, I want the community to know we that's exactly what we did last year. We went as big as we thought we needed to go. And that's what I'm trying to replicate. When we send out those invitations, that's, that's regular that's what we do normally in a non-pandemic year. But this year, as we did last year, we're also sending invitations to students to, to students and buildings that have not been identified to receive Title I funding. So I, I, I definitely agree with you. And I just wanna point out that that's exactly what we're doing. That's what we're trying to dream as big as we can, but we know we, al we also have to make sure that we're, um, we're staffing it with the, with the, you know, the right people who can provide the, the level of, uh, instruction that we're looking to provide for our students. Great, thank you. Mm. All right, anybody else? Uh, so seeing none, uh, Dr. Bodie, your superintendent's report. Thank you, Dr. McNeil. Yes, thank you very much. And thank you for all the suggestions. We're, we're gonna keep plugging away with this and, and um, I will, you know, as we have certain uh, successes and I will keep you updated as to where we are. Great, Dr. Bodhi. Um, well, first of all, I, I just wanted to report on this week. This was a um, uh, another major pivot week in the Arlington Public Schools and the elementary. And, and I would have to say um, that it's gone very smoothly. There's been, you know, certainly there's always some bumps along the way. Um, as you adjust to perhaps uh, the schedule's not working quite the way you thought and you, you, you change, which it seems to be the way of this year. But overall, it, it's really gone very smoothly. And uh, I do wanna acknowledge our, our administrators and our teachers and staff who really worked hard to make that the case. So, well, Next week we have a, another week and then we'll be moving into the secondary. So going from there, I wanna talk about the, um, where we are with the high school project. The building committee met on this last Tuesday and um, approved a, a number of, um, rec a, a number of um, what they call owner approved um, letters uh, with regard to um, contractors for the project. Right now, we have, that's 97% complete. So when we go out for steel or we go out for tiles, any of those are for the entire project, not for just the steam wing or the performing arts. So in terms of the orders, really they've done a remarkable job as to where we are. Um, one of the uh, one of the um, approvals that was given by the building committee was to have terrazzo floors uh, through the entire, um, uh, you know, the entrance from Mass Ave as well as the entrance from 
the back of the school, actually we'll call it the field side of the school and, and through the cafeteria. So um, that was one of the uh, major um, amounts that were approved, which it all becomes uh, several hundred thousand dollars. The, um, all in all, it's really moving along quite well. It's on schedule, it's on, it's on budget. So no concerns in that respect. I will say, however, that the hours um, that people are on the job, even during the weekday, as well as Saturdays, has been increased to make sure that we meet the scheduled date in which we can move into both of the, the new additions. Um, and uh, one of the reasons for needing to have extra hours is some of the delays that happened initially with, uh, with steel. And you know, honestly, there was not much that our contractor or um, our OPM could do about that. So, but the plan is to make sure that we, we have, uh, we continue to have the February 11th, uh, 2022 as the date that we will complete phase one, which are the two buildings that are being constructed on the on front field. So um, the other thing I report about the high school is that we have chosen colors, finalized that this week and they're they're mainly neutrals for the whole school. Um, in the steam wing, we're going to stick with um, a, a series of blues that go through the different floors. And the idea is to have a different blues. And, and it's, it's a way of knowing where you are, which is something that was highly suggested by um, uh, our disability commission for one thing, as well as our architects. When we move to the humanities wing, that's going to be in other tone, warmer tones um, of the maroons to sort of a, or, a lighter orange to a yellow. So it's going to be more in the warmer tones. But you know, we have made the we have moved along in that respect, um, which is sort of significant actually. And I remember when we did Thompson, it took us actually a lot longer time with the colors there than. It's taken us with the high school. But I think people who are on the interiors committee are, are, and are quite pleased and the colors were presented to the, the whole building committee this last Tuesday with some modifications since then. So the other thing I will report, we're still working on technology, we're still working on furniture and equipment, but that is also moving along. The one thing I would also encourage people to look at are the videos that we have um, on the, on the website there. Um, our contractor Consigli has been working with the communication subcommittee to sort of stay up to date with, um, the, with the project. So that, that's where we are right now. The next meeting of the building committee is in early May, May 4th. And um, actually before, I really don't have much more. I just want to report on athletics. I don't know if there's any questions or comments that Mr. Thielman or Dr. Allison Ampey would have uh, who, are, who are the members on the uh, building committee. Dr. Bodie led the effort to select the colors for the Thompson. They came out great. She led the effort to collect the, select the, and does much more than just this, but the colors. Uh, the high school is much different. It's gonna be very, it's gonna be very elegant and yes. very much more subdued. Um, it's a high school. Yes. And it's a community center, so it's very different. Yeah, I'm well, I'm complimenting you. I mean, they, yeah, 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 yes. No, I mean, yeah, Dr. Bo yeah. So I would say, yes, the Dr. Bodie summed up the meeting and where we're at really well. We have more terrazzo tile, which is a very nice thing and good thing for, for it's, it's, it's a surface that lasts longer and is actually better for the, the ambiance of the building. And the, yeah. the, 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 the colors that Dr. Bodie and her committee picked out are wonderful. And, uh, we continue to be very excited about the project. I, I can't add anything more to it. Uh, Kirstie, I mean, Dr. Allison Ampey probably has more to add. She has her. Oh, I think she's, oh. she's got her hand up though. Oh, okay. Can you hear me? We, we sure can. can. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so I just wanted to clarify that the colors that Dr. Bodie is talking about are only the accent colors. The main colors for the floors, the walls are more neutral 
the accent colors will be found in uh, areas around the light wells, which will be kind of the pop of color in this whole big classroom space. I mean, the whole big hallway space. Um, and I think around the lockers and stuff, I we've had pictures and then there'll be like one accent wall in each of the classrooms with these different colors, mm -hmm. depending on which wing. So I didn't want people to hear this and think, oh my God, there's going to be like a whole blue hallway or blue classroom or something. Well, thank you. That, that's actually a great clarification. I should have said that, that these are accent colors. The, the tone of the whole school is really neutrals, um, uh, some beiges, light grays. It's, it's, um, but you can't have the entire building be in neutrals. You need some kind of color. And, um, and, and, and so these are exactly right. So if everybody, we should probably come back to the committee sometime and show these diagrams. These are very, the light wells are quite large. They're elliptical. And I think on the longest, of uh, uh, the longest um, part of it, if you can think of an ellipse, I think it's something like 24 feet, it's quite large, but it's still an accent color just to give, uh, give some color to the building, but it's going to be you know, generally very subdued. I just want to state for the record that I contributed absolutely nothing to the color discussion. I have no talent, nothing to add. It was Dr. Bodie and her committee they did all the work. They got the gifts for it. I'm serious. They're very, very good at this color thing. So, yeah. well, yeah, yeah thank you. Um, I, I'm. That, that's also good and not that you know if people don't like a particular one that, that you're 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 um, you're absolved from this. But I, I, well, I know I like everybody. it. I'm going to defend it. I'm going to defend it. Uh, for eternity. <laughs> I know you will. I think it's actually going to be quite lovely. Um, and Dr. Allison Ampey is on the Interiors Committee and. One thing I will say is that there was high levels of agreement on the colors and what eventually were given to a high level. People didn't like a particular color and it was just pretty much universal. So what I think we ended up with um, is not ended up with, but um, what was finally decided upon, I think people are going to be very happy with. Um, all right, the last thing is our athletic program. As you know, we've had four seasons this year and um, the Boston Globe and the Herald, um, they call it the Boston Globe and Boston Herald All Scholastic. We've had a, a number of students that have um, been, been honored in, in that. And I just, I would like to mention their names and what they were honored for. And each of the seasons will have these designations. So the Boston Globe and Boston Herald All Scholastic Hockey uh, team uh, with Maddie Krakalka. And um, then there are three uh, honorable mentions. For the girls Alpine Skiing team, there was Katherine Klosterman. For the boys Alpine Skiing team, we had Oren. Uh, um, uh, Abrahami, I mean, you mispronounce it, Abrahami. And for the girls basketball team was Claire um, Ewan. For the Boston Herald All Scholastic Hockey Dream Team, we had Shay O'Day. So I wanna congratulate these students. They really represented Arlington High School very well. And um, uh, from what I understand from our athletic director, these were well-deserved honors. So congratulations to them. Thank you. And that's, that's the end of my report. Thank you, Dr. Bodhi. Any questions, uh, Mr. Schickman? I wanna get back to the high school. Um, I heard February 11th as a uh, opening date for phase one, the front of the building. Uh, can, can I have a brief, understanding of the logistics uh, that will occur around February vacation to move from the current building into the front and any impacts on teaching and learning that might come as a result. 
Well, that is certainly part of the planning that will go on. Uh, some of the moving will actually start taking place a little, whatever we can will take place before that. Certainly all new furniture is coming to these buildings. So that will already be in the buildings before the, um, before the actual move over the February break. But the, uh, to your point, which I think is a really important one, we want to make sure that we minimize or not have any disruption uh, to student learning. So I think initially the hope was this could have happened over the December break um, into you know, to the first of the year, but it really needs a little bit more time. So the, the goal is the February vacation ne that next year. So we, we, we're, we're, for parents of high school students looking forward to what will happen in February, as far as they, they're concerned, sending the kid to school, getting the kid back home, it's gonna be seamless. And they're, there's really, you know. I hope, I hope so. I hope it will be seamless. There's certainly a, a, a lot of planning that will go on as we, you know, we get through the summer and have a, a better idea, but the, um, this is going to require a lot of teaming uh, with the contractor and the high school administration. Um, but I have a lot of confidence that that will actually be as seamless as, as possible. The, the, it's, it's not even the move into the building, it's also the move in, in the school itself. So what will happen after students start using that, the, the steam wing and the performing arts, is that we're gonna start having abatement that's going to happen in the column house. That's, a, that's the, the, the front of the entrance, the bullfinch um, architecture. That whole building is going to be demolished. So any programs, any, any um, teachers or programs that are, per, that are in that building will be moved to the Downs building. So it's in the STEAM, of course, it's science, math, technology, or arts program. But for example, the lab program will go to Downs. And um, so there's going to be a reshuffling that's gonna to have to take place as well. Mm -hmm. so and, and that's we, part of phasing. So maybe we could do, um, once Mr. Hainer, takes on his chair, maybe we could have a, a, an agenda item around this so that people can understand where we're at. Can I make a point on that, if I could? Go ahead, Mr. Thielman. Yeah, so the, the, the Harlington High School Building Committee has a temporary use phasing subcommittee. Um, and to let Dr. Janger, Dr. Bodie, uh, the, the construction team, they're all on that subcommittee. And they are talking about this issue and you know we don't have a final plan yet. They'll have a final plan mm -hmm. you know, at some point when they're ready to report. I think that's an appropriate time to bring someone from that committee, probably Dr. Jenger, and maybe someone from the design team to the school committee to give a report. But they're not they're not ready yet. They're not ready now. Yeah. As long as there's nothing that we need to worry about in terms of our planning to run school next year at this point. No, but no, because the. I mean that, that that subcommittee is well represented by school by the school administration. They're all involved in this whole discussion with the design team. So, I think it would be good to have that committee, probably Dr. Janger from that group, report out sometime to the school committee in the fall. Mm -hmm. When so, Mr. Hainer can make a note of that and yeah. Okay, because I'm really excited about this. I'm watching this building go up mm -hmm. and. and they're putting in the walls and, and doing all, it, it's going to be wonderful. And, I, and I'm just sort of excited about the next steps of moving forward and into the new building and proceeding with the next phase. It, it's, it's, it's glorious. I, I'm, I'm just so pleased with the work that's going on. And thank you to the uh, building committee folks for uh, making it so easy for, on our end. <laughs> yeah, it hasn't been that. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Great. Okay. Anybody yeah. else for Dr. Bodie's report? 
All right, seeing none, um, the consent agenda, all items listed with an asterisk are considered, <coughs> excuse me, to be routine will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests, in which event the item will be considered in its normal sequence. Warrant for approval, warrant dated 3-30-2021, warrant number 21215, total warrant amount $736,524.04, minutes for approval, school committee regular meeting, March 25th, 2021. Dr. Allison Ampey. Can you pull the minutes, please? Yeah. So just the warrant. Move to approve as presented. Second. Uh, Ms. Exton? Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Mr. Schlickman? Yes. Mr. Hainer? Yes. And I am also yes. So now I'm looking for a motion to approve the minutes for the regular school committee meeting on March 25th, 2021. I'll move. Second. Any discussion? Uh, Dr. Allison Ampey? I'm Mark, both present and absent. I should be absent last week. If you read it, it at the top it says I'm present and then it says I'm absent. I was absent, I'm going to abstain. Thank you. So we can approve the minutes as amended by Dr. Allison Ampey during her absenteeism. Um, great. Any more discussion on these minutes? Seeing none, Ms. Exton? Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey? Abstain. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Mr. Schickman? Yes. Mr. Hainer? Yes. And I am also yes. Uh, Policy BEDB, agenda format, prep and dissemination, and JKAA, physical restraint of students, second read. Uh, Mr. Schlickman, do you want to let us know where we're at with this? Where uh, I move approval of BEDB. Second. Uh, discussion? All right, seeing none, uh, Ms. Exton? No. Mr. Carnan? No. Dr. Allison Ampey? No. Mr. Thielman? No. Mr. Schlickman? Yes. Mr. Hainer? Yes. And I'm also a no. Um, and the other one? I so, move approval of JKA. Move approval of JKAA. Second. Uh, discussion? Um, okay, seeing none, uh, Ms. Exton? Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Mr. Schlickman? Yes. Mr. Hainer? Yes. And I am also yes. Okay, subcommittee liaison reports and announcements. Budget, Dr. Allison Ampey? Budget will be meeting on Monday. Um, on the agenda is the discussion of some financial record requests from finance committee not there's not concerns that we did anything that, that there was any impropriety there there is um mr foskett who is chair of the finance committee made a presentation on monday past monday um basically saying that he thinks the schools are have been overfunded and he went over a bunch of things and we're going to discuss our response to that. I personally felt that some of the numbers and such that he presented were not actually correct. Um, and so that's part of what we'll be pulling together. Uh, so this is, we will be having our, oh, the other thing is that uh, Mr. Carmen, also from the finance committee, who's our FinCom rep, will be there and, and I think maybe some other finance committee members, they're tasked with helping come up with the answers to these things. Um, there will be the education budget discussed more on Wednesday night. Um, and then there'll be a long range plan meeting on Friday. And all these topics are going to be of interest and are potentially of interest to other members of the committee. So I wanna be sure that you all are aware of this. Um, 
and because we're not going to have another regular school committee meeting in, in this time. So if you are interested, follow along with budget um, and um, pipe in then. So thank you. Mr. Schickman? Uh, can we make sure that the uh, Mr. Foskett's presentation is in the Novus uh, for next Monday's uh, budget meeting so we can see yep. what we will do. Thank you. Uh, community relations, Mr. Hainer. Uh, last Saturday, the school committee chat was with the ELL parents. We had uh, 15 different parents. It was a good turnout, good discussion. This Saturday will be, uh, the focus will be on K to five parents. Thank you. Uh, CIA, Mr. Cardin. And nothing to report, thanks. Facilities, Mr. Thielman. No report. Policy, Mr. Schlickman. No report, thank you. Uh, high School Building Committee, Mr. Thielman. We discussed it. Uh, liaison reports. Dr. Allison Ampey. I'm not a liaison report. I'm going back to budget. I'm sorry, I didn't have notes. Um, I forgot to say that in between our last meeting, we had the finance committee presentation and I wanted to commend Mr. Mason and Dr. Bodhi. It was a very well done presentation. It was very well received, not everything Mr. Foskett is doing notwithstanding. Um, and uh, it, uh, I just wanted to be sure that the rest of you knew that. So that's all. Great, other liaison reports. Uh, announcements. Mr. Hainer. I just want to say publicly that you're going to be a hard act to follow. Thank you. Uh, future agenda items. Mm -hmm. All right, seeing none, uh, we are not having executive session. Motion to adjourn. I want to thank the chair for a great year. I want to thank the chair Absolutely. for an awesome year. Awesome. Yeah, I think Kathy want. Did you uh, want an executive session, Kathy? Oh, I, I, I did actually. Oh, um, okay. <laughs> you know, I thought it was on here. Sorry about oh, that. No, it's on here. I just, it's often on here and we just blow right by it. So uh, <laughs> we are going to executive session. It's a very short one. Okay. Uh, so executive session to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with union and or non-union personnel or contract negotiations with union and or non-union in which if held an open meeting, may have a detrimental effect. Principal contracts to conduct strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation, which if held an opening meeting may have a detrimental effect. Collective bargaining may also be conducted. So moved. Second. Second. Ms. Exton? Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes, and are we returning afterwards? We're not. Uh -huh. <laughs> Uh, we're not coming back. Uh, thank you, though. Uh, Mr. Thielman? Yes. Mr. Schlickman? Yes. Mr. Hainer? Yes. I am also yes. All right. Thank you.